and uh, Dr. Gurwari D, the organizing chairman, has put in a lot of efforts to put this together. And we really look forward to the next three days of deliberations. So without much ado, let me hand over the proceedings to Dr. Gurwari Reddy, the organizing chairman. Over to you, Gurwari. Muted. You have to unmute. Gurwari, I think you are muted. Yes, you are muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here as an organizing chairman. And uh, the proceedings will be started on a very scientific note. I've got our educational chair, Dr. Mohanty is there. He will welcome the gathering and start the proceedings. Mohanty, off to you. Good morning, good evening to you all. Dear friends, greetings from Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons and welcome to the 14th Annual Congress of East that is East 2021. This was supposed to be in Hyderabad in a physical form, but under the shadow of the pandemic, we are holding it this year on a virtual platform. Now, as you know, Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeon is a body which is totally devoted to the academics as well as the registry of this country. And Dr. Guru Varedi, the organizing chairman and all the members of the organizing committee has put a beautiful program together covering every aspect of primary and revision uh, hip and knee orthoplasty. There are case discussions and as well there is a session devoted for the registry and as well as we have our combined session with the uh, American Academy of Hip and Knee Surgeons. So you enjoy all the three, day, three days of academy extravaganza. I welcome you all and now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Guruvaridi to start the program for today. Over to yeah. Guruvar, please. Yeah, thank you, Shubhanshu. And it's a, again, pleasure to invite all of you and uh, the overseas faculty for this, the opening batsman is uh, Raymond Robinson and uh, Victor Hernandez also will be in the panel and uh, again, Nikhil Shah will be in the panel. And I request my good friend, Rajesh Malhotra, to start the opening session. And he is the moderator for the next 30 minutes. He will be orchestrating a beautiful program for you. Rajesh, off to you. Thank you, Gurva. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be uh, a part of this uh, uh, noted illustrious panel. Uh, and uh, without wasting any time, I would request Dr. Raymond Robinson to start his talk on uh, horses for courses Implant selection for primary, complex primary, and revision hip replacement. Raymond. So, so my lecture is pre-recorded, so someone needs to start it. Um, yes, sir. So we'll start playing the pre-recorded one. That's right. Yeah. Greetings from Miami. I've been asked to give a lecture on implant selection in primary, complex primary, and revision total hip replacements. These are my disclosures. Um, I looked at my uh, choices for primary total hip stems over the past 40 years, and there's obviously been a gradual change from cemented to uncemented implants, as you see. Uh, I'd also point out the beginning of a prospective uh, database that I began and continued to this day uh, uh, from 1986. This has been invaluable in evaluating different implant choices over time and resulted in the progression of choices that I made. Um, there's nothing wrong with a well-done hybrid total hip replacement. Here's a 20-year follow-up. Um, uh, it's a controlled stem insertion. The stem height and leg length determined by the neck cut. Uh, little reliance on the proximal femoral bone geometry version fine-tuned control at the last uh, portion of seating in the cement full uh, length stem fixation in this case with cement uh, and the stem diameter is less than the canal uh, keeping in mind the stem strength versus stem stiffness um, uh, issue uh, 
Uh, it's very difficult to do an acceptable cemented total uh, hip stem in my uh, institution. Um, there are 30 steps in my uh, uh, technique, and the residents all want to see the case. And really, you're the only one in the room uh, who knows uh, the steps that you want to follow. Um, my first uncemented uh, stem was the original CLS, a titanium alloy uh, implant with a new corundum blast finish. Uh, we were very impressed with the fixation, 96% good or excellent results at 92 months, uh, minimal thigh pain, excellent fixation. We really became believers in this uh, uncemented uh, uh, fixation technology, but uh, we were only using it in patients with good bone quality. Had, it had a very poor originally uh, head-to-neck diameter ratio high dislocation rate, uh, very valgus neck geometry, which made it difficult to reproduce uh, offset and anatomy. Uh, and leg length was somewhat unpredictable because it was difficult to predict the final seating height of the implant. So we became very interested in a new technology, the Identifit at that time, which is a custom implant uh, allowing us to take a mold of the canal. Uh, and while we were working on the acetabulum, we could uh, manufacture the stem uh, interoperatively, uh, putting in any kind of offset, any kind of antiversion uh, that we uh, desired. So it was really something. Um, but uh, we were the first to um, uh, report the poor uh, results, 17% revision rate at three, uh, 30 months. Uh, clearly, um, a perfect press fit without any kind of osteointegration surface uh, was not sufficient. Um, so we retreated to a more conventional stem uh, system that allowed us to transition from a cemented to a uh, cementless stem intraoperatively. Uh, so we were still using cemented stems in patients with poor bone quality. In 2008, I was still looking for an uncemented stem that I could use in all my primary hips. Uh, I wanted a controlled insertion, uh, much like the cemented stem, uh, could be used in all my patients, allow reliable implant uh, seating height, uh, allow variable neck cut heights to achieve correct leg length, no reliance on the calcar curve, full length osseointegration surface. Three things had changed by that time that were important to me. The technology of HA coding had been perfected, long-term results of the Karai stem had been reported, uh, and the exclusivity of uh, the uh, Karai type stem geometry uh, and design had expired. Uh, so we became interested in a fully HA coded stem called the Element Stem. Uh, it was a Karai type uh, design with some modifications, full length HA coding, thinner HA coding than the Karai uh, to allow a more reproducible seating of the implant, uh, and right or wrong, we chose the Collis uh, version. Um, uh, we reviewed uh, 277 uh, hips, uh, found 92.4% uh, survival at five years. There were four fractures, due, uh, two due to subsidence uh, very quickly after the operation. Um, uh, two were uh, truly traumatic events uh, later in the follow-up. Uh, 18 stems subsided more than four millimeters, which uh, uh, we did not uh, like. Um, and there were four aseptic loosenings with progressive radiolucencies uh, without infection. Um, so my current choice of primary total hips is now a fully HA-coded uh, stem, Karai type of design. I've now changed to using a collar. I think it's a good idea, especially to uh, limit subsidence. It may have an effect on fracture rate uh, early post-op. And I do not hesitate to put in a, an occasional prophylactic wire or cable, um, especially in patients with poor bone quality. So what about complex primaries and revisions? We typically face four challenges. Limited or poor bone stock, uncertain lib length, uh, joint instability, and remember, you may be wise to uh, recall that you may have to remove the implant eventually. Um, 
there are two implant design choices that we face in these difficult cases. One is whether uh, to use metaphyseal fixation or diaphyseal fixation. And the other is whether to consider a, a modular or monoblock implant. One excellent choice uh, for proximal fixation in a modular device has be become the SROM. Uh, we were and all people concerned about the modular junction that was introduced with this implant. But with 11-year follow-ups, uh, Hugh Cameron reported very impressive results without any difficulty with the uh, uh, tapered junction. Uh, so with that, uh, we began using the SROM uh, quite a bit. Uh, but there are limited metaphyseal and stem combination options. Uh, and they're limited options as far as the varying neck height. Uh, also, the SROM uh, does fracture at times, uh, but interestingly, it's, it rarely involves uh, any difficulty with the taper junction, a titanium alloy, titanium alloy uh, junction. So we became interested in a three-part modular uh, stem, um, which had uh, uh, fully interchangeable segments. So necks with different heights, as you see on the left, um, uh, different size metaphyseal, uh, separate from different size uh, stems. Um, uh, this was uh, very useful, uh, particularly in big uh, uh, metaphyseal, diaphyseal mismatch. Uh, here you see such a situation in a revision of a, uh, a healed uh, periprosthetic uh, fracture. Um, uh, uh, but um, my partner uh, had uh, one fatigue failure at the neck metaphyseal junction, so we stopped using it. This was in a patient who weighed 340 pounds. Uh, in 1996, a work hardening technique was introduced in industry called low plasticity burnishing. Uh, in 2005, to further increase the taper strength in the Accumatch modular, uh, implant low plasticity burnishing uh, was used uh, to increase the taper strength 30 percent. Currently uh, we are following 32 patients after that improvement um, uh, and we reported 95 uh, percent survival at five years, now nine years, without any ta taper uh, uh, failures. An example of the use of this device uh, in primary hip replacements is a patient who uh, had an acetabular uh, fracture dislocation. Uh, it healed in this manner. Um, and uh, you can see how the, uh, the position of the acetabular component was uh, uncertain. So it was very nice to have the versatility of different uh, neck heights uh, to solve this problem. Another uh, example of uh, use of this implant is in the second stage of a two-stage infection revision uh, where we're often faced with mismatches between the, uh, dia the metaphyseal and diaphyseal portion. Uh, for these uh, other types of fractures, such as this Vancouver B3, uh, you certainly cannot rely on the proximal bone stock. Um, you have to uh, use some type of distal fixation device. Uh, and the corundum blast finish, so successful for us in our CLS experience, has revolutionized the treatment of these cases. Uh, the corundum blast finish stimulates the activation of uh, prostaglandins E2 and uh, transforming growth factor resulting in really direct bone on growth, which is uh, uh, incredibly uh, successful. Um, most companies now offer modular versions of this type of uh, distal fixation uh, uh, technology. Um, but if you use the taper uh, uh, designs, uh, you're always concerned, as we are, about failure at the taper junction. Uh, but it m certainly makes uh, obtaining uh, the correct leg length uh, much easier. Uh, companies also often uh, offer monoblock uh, versions of this type of technology using the corundum blast finish with tapered fluted stems. Um, uh, be aware that there are variations in taper angle from the central axis of 3 to 5 degrees, and there are also variations in the flute shapes, um, either sharp and pointed or rectangular 
Um, there are arguments for either. So what would you do in this one? A 92-year-old woman, motor vehicle accident, had a compression fracture of the lumbar spine and a humerus fracture as well, and faced with this uh, unbelievable, uh, uh, challenging um, uh, uh, periprosthetic fracture. Um, uh, well, in this case, you can't use any of the technology that we talked about. Uh, you have to go to a tumor implant uh, using some type of uh, ultrasonic, such as Oscar technique, to melt into the existing cement mantle, probably the strongest thing in this patient's uh, uh, femur uh, when she presented. Um, I thank you very much for your attention, and it's a great pleasure uh, and honor to be participating in uh, this conference. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Raymond. Uh, can I share the screen now? So now gentlemen, we have a great panel and we have a lot of ground to cover. So I will quickly come to each one of you with a scenario and then take some quick comments from the other faculty members. So I think in the interest of time, I'll really appreciate if we keep your comments short and, uh, and uh, uh, we can actually uh, cover more and more ground. So we are going to talk about the implant selection. So let me start with you, Victor. What will you do in this case? Your choice oh, is implant. Yeah, so challenge case as always. Uh, for this type of stem, we need a, a, a full forest code, long stem. I, um, I, I will re first. We have to rule out that there's an infection. No, there is no infection. We are, we are talking. We keep ourselves to implant selection. Trust me, there's no infection. Okay, good. So if there's no infection, I will remove uh, as, uh, the plates. Uh, I will probably remove for the second plate. I don't know if it's a second plate. Yes. I will remove only the screws. And then, oof. That's, uh, uh, the problem is if, if I can use a short stem, and then I have to uh, provide some kind of support, either with the struts or another long plate that covers the whole femur. I, I probably don't go and remove the, the, the nail, and I use a short stem, one of the uh, new short stem, but great. it has to be a fruit and fit and feel full photos. So great. I, I was wondering why you're sounding so tentative. So this is what I did, and uh, you know, I uh, like you said, won't like to leave a stress riser here between the tip of the stem and the plate. So uh, I just cut off the plate here, removed the screws, and uh, and sorry, didn't cut off the plate, just removed the screws and removed this plate, and uh, that's it. So uh, this is a paper written on small stints for big challenges, where the authors say that the femoral deformities from malunion prior osteotomy and retained surgical implants are challenging and short stems can be used in these cases to spare the patient increased morbidity. So just quickly showing you something like this and you can get away with resurfacing. Uh, Vijay will like that, I'm sure. And you can have proximal deformity like this and you can again get away with a short stem. So I know a lot of people don't believe in short stems, but if you have a femoral deformity, obliteration of the femoral canal, uh, you can get away uh, with a short stem. And uh, this is a paper on hip arthroplasty in the presence of proximal femoral deformity, where it said that, you know, the implant selection is extremely important. Now, let me come to uh, Vijay, I think, because this is more of an Indian problem. So this is poliomyelitis. So how will it, the, the left hip is the, is the paralyzed left hip? And the power on the right side is fine. So how will you choose the implant for this? The power on the right is fine, you said, yeah. Normal yeah. power on the right side, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, this is a polio which is complicated by although the muscle power is normal, you have a, a fixed pelvic obliquity that's not going to correct post-op. So I need some kind of thing that would prevent dislocation in the in future. And uh, it's a very high riding hip. So I would uh, do a uh, dual mobility cup for this one and do uh, with the SROM, I do a subprochandric shortening osteotomy. That would be my plan. That is fantastic. And just quickly talking about, uh, we have some experience with this. 
so there is an iliolumbar fascia release required if the if the there is a structural uh, scoliosis but otherwise the first thing we do is to do the suters and jounts release on the opposite side and then go ahead and do exactly what uh, uh, what vijay has said and uh, if you have done the suters and jounts release well uh you can the residual pelvic tilt gradually gets corrected and you may have to give something for limb length uh, discrepancy but important thing is that when we are talking about hip arthroplasty in patients with neuromuscular imbalance you know just like uh, vijay told you you have to selectively use the constraint liners for instability because there be instability abductor insufficiency or hyperlexity and now we have a dual mobility and my choice would have been exactly the same what uh, uh, what vijay has said but remember the neurological problems can be spastic or flaccid but then for both of them you will need to take care of instability and this is a paper we published in journal of arthroplasty very recently and the choice is just, just what uh, vijay said modular implant and a constraint or a dual mobility cup so um, um we have just now seen this i'll just uh, uh, show you this why we did the suters and jounts here because this was a patient with pelvic obliquity and a uh, arthrodes hip and somebody operated on the opposite hip without taking care of this and you see even a large head will not be or a constrained liner will not be able to take care of it so we had to do a, 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 a gutter stone here and then fix this so remember that now um, i'll come back to um, uh to nikhil nikhil what do you do for fracture neck of femur we all know that there is a high risk of dislocation in these cases so how do you choose your implant we are just about to publish our data on 120 cemented total hips uh, for neck of femur fractures uh, done by specialist hip surgeons with a less than 1% risk of dislocation using uh, 28 and 32 mm heads so my standard hip would be what i do for a primary a cemented total hip with a 28 mm head in most women and a 32 mm head in most men dr pachore sir you are muted sir sir you are muted dr pachore sir pachore is muted i think rajesh you can ask raymond okay okay so i'll i'll, I'll ask uh, uh, can i add something rajesh yeah Yes, please. So the neglected fracture neck of femur is quite different from acute fracture neck of femur. It's got shortening, so dislocation is not a problem. And I wouldn't want anything special for this case. I would do a standard hip replacement. The 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 shortening protects you against any future dislocations. So what about the fresh case? Would you do anything differently yeah. than nickel? It would depend on the uh, size of the cup. Small cup, uh, you know, forty to forty four. I'll go dual mobility. If it is say forty six, forty eight, I would uh, try and maximize the head size. Use lip liners if necessary. So for a 36 head i have no issues with that so i think that's a very important message there that you don't want to leave a small head there and they are quite lax and i think depending on the size of the acetabulum you can either go for a standard total hip or you go for a dual mobility my choice for these cases now uh, where there is a high risk of dislocation is to operate by direct anterior approach and put in a dual mobility if there is a high risk and actually because of the laxity they are the easiest cases to do by direct anterior approach if you are a beginner for direct anterior approach i would suggest that you start with uh, the fracture neck of femur now um, uh, dr um, uh, pachore i want to know your uh, uh, experience with uh, uh, with the dual mobility and then maybe we can ask uh, uh, raymond uh, one important thing which i have, uh, uh, i want to share was the for for fracture neck femur I think the the young surgeon have to from this country at least have to learn from anterolateral approach, and uh, I agree with uh, uh, Vijay that if the cup size is small, I think the double mobility cup is a very good. But at least minimum you should have a 32 32 millimeter for this patients, and you might increase a little bit of neck length uh, and leg length. And second is you increase five to ten degrees of antiversion of these patients so that you get a reduction a reduction. And if they are with Parkinson. do uh, adductor tenotomy of this patient's uh, parkinson patient sometimes i have done this patient spastic patient i do an obturator neurotomy also to to reduce the rate of dislocation that is another thing which is i want those, and uh, those yeah. are great tips dr pachore uh, raymond what how what how frequently do you use a dual mobility cup in your practice 
uh, I'm a little surprised at all the jumping to dual mobility in this particular patient, unless there's something uh, more than a straightforward fracture. Uh, in this particular case, I would just do a, a total hip uh, with a 36 millimeter ball, uh, mm-hmm. as I would uh, with uh, my con- conventional uh, approach. Um, for me, the dual mobility comes in handy when there are other factors. Uh, um, uh, well, soft tissue laxity, uh, we just did a CP, uh, uh, an adult cerebral palsy patient uh, uh, who uh, uh, I think will benefit from a dual mobility. I'm still waiting for long-term uh, follow-up information on dual mobilities. I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to perform uh, in the uh, long term. Right. So, um, Dr. Pachore, again, an Indian problem. Yeah. So, uh, in spinopelvic deformity like this, what would be your choice of implant, sir? Uh, no, implant is just uh, normal uh, normal implant, whatever the, uh, maybe 32, 36. I don't go for a younger patient, double mobility cup. Even they are ankylosing patient or they have a spinal deformity, whatever. These are very young patients and just now Robinson said that we really don't know what is the long-term results of double mobility, but especially these young patients. So, I, my choice is going to be 32, 36, whatever it is. That will be the choice, uncemented and the stem also uncemented. But so I what look which stem and which cup, sir? I will have a look at the lateral X-ray of this patient. It's very important for me to know whether he has got lordosis or kyphosis. That dictates me. And second important uh, important tip is please do intraoperative uh, intraoperative reduction and do the templating intraoperative templating rather than going for immediate immediate uh, uh, implants. That is another thing which see as any at least impingement phenomena which is taking place. I agree that the dislocation occurs in a dynamic phase, not in static. But at least your duty is to see at least static part of it. And you may not be able to see dynamic part of it. But why very important to get the lateral X-ray and your uh, stand, uh, standing and sitting X-ray to know what is the pelvic param- parameters for these patients. But to surprise Rajesh, ankylosing spondylitis in this country, we have a large number of patients, but dislocation rate is very, very low. Reasons are they do not go into the impingement range, range. and that is another thing. And that their elasticity of the soft tissue is not that good, which is going to get the dislocation rate. That is another important thing we have to keep in mind. Third, they get ectopic ossification, and that does not allow sometimes to have a dislocation. Uh, these are very important factors that they have a rate of dislocation is on the lower side. I just last week only I uh, asked Vijay to take the plan of this uh, study uh, in this country. You are very right, sir. We had published in Journal of Arthroplasty in our series with Dr. Bhan about the cementless arthroplasty in bony ankylosis and we reported that there was a subset of patients who gradually lost movement because of soft tissue, uh, uh, loss, loss of soft tissue pliability without any obvious reason. The biggest challenge in this case was to position it on the table because you put, can't put in lateral. So, uh, like the two incision MIS or direct interior, we first did an osteotomy bilaterally and then put the patient in lateral position and did this. So, uh, what we um, recommend is actually if the patient is affording, we put an SROM stem because in case the patient develops instability because of the severe spinopelvic deformity uh, in this country, the, the cost is a big factor. You can just knock out the stem, change the version and put them, uh, uh, put that back, back the same implant. Uh, this was a case where we burnt our fingers. This is a lateral view also for you, sir. But this patient actually uh, uh, developed dislocation and uh, we had to actually revise. You can see uh, how I had to revise the orientation and reduce the antiversion uh, remarkably. In the, This was actually a uh, position in which it dislocated and it became stable when I reduced the version of the cup. The message here is that you should be ready to change the version and sometimes a modular stem will uh, help you in these cases. Now, there's coming another, to Excuse me, there's another important point to make uh, for the younger surgeons. Make sure you're thinking about the next operation this patient may need. Not all companies have all of the variety of liners and, and dual mobilities and everything else. Make sure the cup you put in has all of the options for the future. That's a great point. Uh, thank you very much. Victor, what is your choice for this uh, this case, choice of implants? Yeah, my choice for this case, uh, normally I, I use for this type of shortening the S-ROM that allows me 
to do a, a short and osteotomy if I need to bring it down. I also, if not, this is a small canal also. The Wagner from uh, Zimmer is a good choice as well. So uh, you can use Wagner if you are choosing shortening or you can use a SOM. Anybody has any other choice of implant if you want to do a shortening? We have um, short uh, cemented stems, the Asian C stems and the small exeter stems and we have used them even with a shortening osteotomy and contrary to popular myth, uh, the osteotomy heals quite well. But I agree the SROM is a good choice. Oh, that's also another interesting point. The other challenge may be, uh, you know, to check in India particularly the availability of the small size acetabular cup to get the, uh, uh, the coverage and uh, this is exactly what we were discussing, small size cup, small diameter stem, need for shortening and a modular option. And uh, this is the six years follow up of the same patient. So again, these authors uh, in their talk on, uh, uh, in the paper on complex primary total hip uh, replacement have emphasized that you will need a, a, a special modular or custom made implant in these cases. And uh, this is um, our experience with SROM. We found it very useful, I'm sure, uh, um, um, Vijay will agree with me that for our setting, I think uh, the SROM remains uh, a very useful tool. Vijay? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Rajesh. Uh, fantastic. And in a Crow 4, I think uh, that is the best implant. And I find a lot of people uh, using standard stems uh, like the Korai, for example, landing into all sorts of problems. So, absolutely, you're right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Malhotra, sorry sorry to interrupt, but we are really run out of time, sir. Yeah. yeah. Rajesh, so it's time to Rajesh, wind up then. So, Rajesh, you, you got one more case? Yeah, I have got many, many cases, but if you have time for oh, okay. this one, we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll call it a day. Yeah, put one more case. No problem. So it's, it's right. No problem. It's one right. More case. Case. We got VBN Prasad and Ashok Raj also on the panel. Okay, good. Okay, so proximal femoral fracture in arthritic hip. So, anybody would like to give the choice of implant for this? Hello, I think uh, I'm Dr. Ashok Raju from Sunshine Hospital. I think uh, the implant of choice on the cup side would be any cup, uncemented cup would do fine. But on the femoral side, I think you need a distal fitting stem with uh, reconstruction of the GT. Right. Any other, uh, would you like to name a stem? I would uh, use a, a Wagner stem. Okay. Wagner. Uh, Vijay? Yeah, I would go by that. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the trochanter as long as I maintain the continuity of the medius and the vast lateralis. And I would just, uh, if necessary, the calcar fragment and this, I wouldn't bother to reconstruct it. I would just, and then the Wagner uh, never breaks. So I'm happy as long as I have the trochanter, big trochanter piece, the attachment of the gluteus medius and the vast lateralis, I'm very happy with that. Dr. Pachori? I think uh, what Vijay says is all right, but I want to reconstruct the trochanter completely. That is right. my so, yeah. yeah, so so did I, and I think uh, uh, Raymond did mention the MP stem, and I think with the modularity and the ease to adjust the limb length, and uh, uh, you know to reconstruct the trochanter around it, I think this is a very good, very good option. So thank you, gentlemen. I want to really profusely thank the panel for actually participating, and thank you, Guruva and Hemant and uh, 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 and uh, Mohanti for giving me this opportunity. Have a nice day and nice evening. Rajesh. Rajesh, Rajesh, thank you so much. Don't disappear. Stay in the panel. Rajesh. Okay. Don't you dare to disappear. Stay in the panel. <laughs> okay. Right. I will now welcome Vijay. And I request, see, the panel is there for next one hour. All the guys. Vijay, Rajesh, Pachore, Indrajit, Victor, Raymond, Nikhil, Ashok Raju and Vivian Prasad are the panel for the next one hour. So don't disappear. Okay. Now I welcome Vijay, a good friend of mine. Uh, so, to moderate as well as give the keynote, right. Uh, thanks, Guru. Uh, uh, thanks, the President, uh, uh, to give the opportunity and uh, Leo, Secretary, thanks very much. Um, so, the my topic is hip displays. Yeah, so the idea is I would just uh, uh, highlight some principles underlying how we manage displays. Yeah, so that we open to the discussion and the discussion, uh, there will be a lot of clinical cases in which the faculty will elaborate how they plan their management. So, this is just to lay down the basics. So we all know about the crow classification and the heart of luck at classification. Uh, one point the juniors may not know is uh, the crow is actually a fellow under a Ranavat and actually Ranavat's classification. 
So we always put uh, crow one to three together because the principles of management are just the same. Whereas the crow four has completely different principles and must never be confused with type one, type two, and type three crow. In the heart of like it is classification, uh, not uh, widely used, but some people would like to call it a low dislocation, high dislocation based on this classification. Now, before going on to the established side, which is the more uh, controversial side and the more interesting side, I will just finish the femur off. So the feminicide issues are three. You have increased antiversion, you have cocks of valga and a low offset. Absolutely three principles that you have to appreciate, otherwise you're going to run into trouble. And uh, to, um, to, uh, to take care of these three issues, you need to have a, a stem with modularity. Not only modularity in version, but also craniocaudal. And that's what a lot of junior surgeons fail to understand. These stems give you craniocaudal. You can place it very high, you can place it very low. The craniocaudal freedom, that's very important, these two stems, the cone wagner and I take from Nikhil that uh, a similar stem would uh, also perform very well in, uh, in writing turn. I, I have seen his work. I've seen the people writing turn. It also is another option, but we don't do that option. So here is a more uh, severe case of Cox of Valka. You can see, and you can see my neck cut. It's about five centimeters on the lesser trochanter. And if we didn't have the stem, and if we use the standard stem like a cry, you run into problems. So that's the uh, point I want to highlight. It's not only the version which everyone is aware of, but the freedom to have a craniocaudal freedom to put the stem wherever you want. So the SROM or the Cone Wagner fits the bill very nicely. So this is a case not by me. I revised this case, but the surgeon didn't appreciate this. And so he tried to sink his, uh, his stem, which was a standard stem, the um, Zoymuller stem. And you can see what has happened. He exited it and then uh, ended up in a miserable failure and was referred to me and I had to revise this. So this should not be done. This is a point for I want to highlight for the juniors. Now, dysplasia comes in various forms. You have varying heights, you have various amount of lateralization, you have varying offsets, and varying amounts of dysplasia. So everything cannot be put into the same bucket. You have to understand the various pathophysiology that goes on. So some uh, important points, very interesting points that uh, people may not be aware of. So the adult characteristics when you see dysplasia depends on the stage of development at the time of incel. You can see that. When the incel develops, exactly the same thing that produces. And what is fascinating is that the socket will always be a mirror image of your head. So when you remove the head on a dysplastic and if you keep it in your hand, you know that it's your socket and you know how to reconstruct your socket. So that's how it works. Now another very important point is the femoral articulation and the weight bearing pattern defines the best bone in the acetabulum based on Wolf's law. So you know we have to look at this uh, how the bone remodeling has occurred in the pseudo acetabulum on the partially dislocated hips and uh, we have to know where the good bone is. I think, that, I think that's a very important principle these days the reconstruction of the uh, dysplastic socket. And of course, the burning issue is where to keep the cup. And I think uh, we'll ask the panelists when you come to discussions that traditionally anatomic placement was uh, preferred. People said that uh, you should not keep it high. And usually they did put a graph. Nowadays, people will maybe put an augment there and they try to uh, maintain the native center of the head. That's what uh, traditionally done. And this came from uh, a landmark paper from uh, Mark Pignano when he described a high failure rate with the high hip centers. So he used cemented sockets in those cases and he published uh, high uh, failure rates. And there are other authors like Kelly and Yoda who also published a high failure rate with the high hip centers. Now remember they were all cemented sockets and cemented sockets are of course non-biological fixation and they all had a very high hip center of more than 3.5 centimeters. And that's probably one of the reasons why they all fail. Now this is a case that is referred to our unit uh, you can see how the surgeon has, uh, uh, you know, followed his principle and he wants to put the cup where the native center is. He's done his planning very rightly, but things can go wrong. He's got it very inferior and this patient unfortunately had to um, uh, end up with a hind quarter amputation. So high hip center came to be frowned upon in hip arthroplasty uh, because it was thought to have higher wear, increased chance of impingement and higher dislocation rate. Our Bill Harris was the first one who said that's not true. And he used non cemented uh, fixations and he published excellent results. It's not only uh, Bill Harris, but Tanza, Bosik, and Kobayashi also published that you can get excellent results with, uh, with high hip centers. Now we know that it's not the high hip center that matters, but lateralizing the socket, which is bad news. So uh, we all accept now that you should not lateralize the socket, it's a very bad thing, but you can keep it the uh, socket a little high. Nothing, uh, and you can aim for a mild to moderate high hip center. It makes your surgery so much simpler and you're leaving the socket in the best available bone. And I think, I think that makes a huge difference. Two landmark papers. One was in the Ranawat group, which published uh, you know, long-term results of uh, high hip centers and uh, excellent results at 10-year follow-up. 
the next paper from Japan, which uh, indicated very good results with the moderate high and uh, with a 15 year follow up. So, these landmark uh, papers uh, sort of change the view of how we, we view things. So, the um, current thinking would be is that the best bone must be loaded. So, there's no point putting the socket in poor bone and putting a bone graft on the best available bone. You'd rather put the non simited socket in the best available bone. Elevated hip center is not a problem. We put unsimited sockets and do it the right way. Directional reaming is important, which I will highlight a little later. And avoid graft. Grafts do very well in the short term, but in the medium term, they don't have great results. So uh, we try to avoid graft as much as possible, structural grafts as much as possible. A classical example of mine, we've done hundreds and hundreds of these. We put it in a moderately high hip center, and the socket size is the same as the contralateral side, and these patients do very well in long-term follow-up. So we have to respect the native size of the astablum. If you put a sort of a jumbo cup in this situation, it's bad news. And we have to preserve the bone stock in the AP and the middle lateral phase. Everybody knows about the uh, you know, super inferior diameter, but important that you don't ream away the socket in the AP plane. That's also very important. So how do you know the uh, native size of the socket? Look at the other side. So a socket in displacia must never be more than the uh, socket on the, on the other side, which is the normal side. Now here is a patient has referred to me. The first side was done somewhere else. And you can see the surgeon has respected the old rule, Pagnana's rule of bringing it down to the anatomic center. But and he says, you know, in the superior inferior direction, it looks okay. But what we don't see on the AP x-rays is that half the pelvis has been reamed away in the AP direction. Bad news. So I got to do the other side. And I suspect this is the native size of the socket. And the other cup is 10 millimeters more than my socket. So this is how we do it these days. We accept a, a moderately high hip center. And we preserve bone in the socket. Like Raymond said, we need to think of the next further surgery if it's going to be done. So we respect the native size and preserve bone in the AP and the middle lateral plane. So how do you use the reaming technique? Uh, if the goals of a reaming technique would be you must eliminate the need for structural autograft. It's very important, as I told. And then it should be bone conserving. There's no point reaming right into the uh, near the bladder and putting a socket. That's not good. So we must be bone conserving. Good. So if we look at the pathanatomy of the dysplastic socket, it's very interesting. We all think that from an AP X-ray, which we always use, we think the dysplasia is from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock. It's not so. It's like an egg that has fallen anteriorly. It's always an oblique direction. In all dysplastic, this is a rule. It'll always like be an oblong shape with the, with the egg fall, uh, falling anteriorly. That would be the direction of dysplasia in all dysplastic segments. Uh, so that's how it looks. There'll be always a structural inferior osteophyte. And then that would be the direction of dysplasia. So now we prefer what we do as the pious directional reaming. That means posterior inferior to anterior superior. So what we do now is the traditional teaching is to remove the osteophyte. Uh, remove the osteophyte and then ream from 6 to 12 like in a standard cup. But if you do that, you ream into normal bone and you don't engage a dysplastic segment which is anterior superior. So if we do a directional reaming and that's not good. So if we do a directional reaming, we do not remove the structural osteophyte. Structural osteophyte is what nature has given you. A good structural osteophyte instead of being... Superior, we keep it inferior, and then we start reaming from there, and we go anterior superior, posterior inferior, to anterior superior. And now we don't ream into normal bone; we preserve bone, but we ream into the dysplastic segment, and that's how we go from posterior inferior to anterior superior. We place the cup slightly anterior superiorly, and we put screws. So uh, the essence of uh, the directional reaming is that slight anterior superior, not only superior placement of the socket, but slight anterior superior placement of the socket. So we have done lots in this, and we haven't had a single failure of the socket in all these uh, type of directional reaming that we have done over the last uh, 15 years. Now, Dor and you have described other techniques where you go through a medial protrusio, where you ream medially. Uh, now we advocate not to do that because you're compromising bone. And it's better to do, and you can see that, you know, in both these techniques, earlier described techniques, the medial bone is compromised. Now, some may say, so what if you compromise the medial bone? But sometimes it gives problem, like in this case shown here. So we always try and keep the middle bone, very, very important. We never ream into the middle bone, but we have a high hip center and we never oversize the socket from that of the contralateral normal side. Now, we're coming to crow 4. Uh, these principles do not apply to crow 4. For the simple reason, you can see in this illustration that the best bone, according to Wolf's law, does not, is not superior, but exactly where the native center is. And that's where you must put your uh, socket because that's where. So, in crow 1, 2, 3, 4, you put the socket where the best available bone is. In crow 1, 2, 3, the best bone is available superior. And in crow 4, it's available at the native center. And we always want to put that. So you can see a classical case of crow 4 on both sides. You can see the uh, in the CT scan, the best bone is undoubtedly at the true center. And this is what we do in this case with the subprochantric shortening osteotomy on both sides. So there are principles of um, uh, our management in place here. Now we'll go on to the three.
case discussions. Is that okay? Anybody has anybody in one morning thing to say? Uh, I I do. Uh, in these cases uh, where you do ream somewhat uh, medially and you're using a very small cup, it always comes up the question, uh, when do I need a structural graph, when do I need a non-structural graph? And I'd just like to point out uh, my philosophy. Uh, I, I think back to Charnley's book that shows the direction of joint reaction force coming down 16 degrees from the vertical. Um, so, um, when I uh, am asking that question, if the line coming down 16 degrees from the vertical to the center of rotation of the prosthetic cup uh, goes through native bone, then I add bone graft that does not have to be structural. Uh, if not, and, it's, and it goes through midair, um, uh, that line, uh, then you've got to be thinking of tantalum wedges or, or uh, uh, gra uh, structural uh, graft. Yeah, I take your point, uh, Raymond, but uh, generally we tend, uh, uh, you know, it's very, very rare for us to read a graft, unless it's a very, very high hip center and crow 2, 3, we're able to manage without a graft in, uh, in most cases. But I take your point, yeah, very valid point. Thanks for that. So my uh, philosophy is similar to Dr. Raymond's. Um, I check off how much coverage I'm going to get. And the difference between crow 1, 2, 3 and the crow 4 is in crow 4, Often you don't actually get a full socket, you just get like a triangular piece of bone and those become quite small and they are very difficult to, to fit a cemented socket into because you have to ream to a minimum of 44 to even get the smallest uh, 38 cemented socket in. So those are very good for uncemented bantam cups because you can go as small as a 4-0 or even a 3-8 if you give them adequate notice. But um, uh, the, the uncemented cups were, works very well with about 20 degrees of uncoverage. The cemented cups don't work well with uncoverage. So if I'm using a cemented cup, I'll almost always do a structural graft. And uh, in our institute, we have about a 75% survivorship of the structural graft to 15 years. And when you go back in to revise the socket, you actually find that the bone is healed. Yeah, I take your point, Nikhil. Absolutely, uh, you know, the writing 10, uh, you know, the structural graft works very well. Um, I mean, those guys are great in this technique, but I must say that uh, whenever I've had the referrals from uh, other surgeons who have done this, uh, it's a quite a high failure rate. I do take your point that if done correctly, it works very well, but it's not a very easily reproducible technique, and that would be my take on that. Yeah, it is, okay. it is unforgiving. It is technique dependent. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and there's a very good point that you made that you need a full cover when you put a cemented socket, and you don't need a full cover. That's a huge advantage. So it makes your surgery very simple. Uh, like any other standard case, we don't uh, sweat over any displacure these days. We just go and do it very quickly. Okay, gentlemen. So let us move on to the discussion. Yeah. So um, uh, for each uh, mild, moderate, and crow four, uh, I'm going to give you two scenarios so that we can uh, compare and contrast what are the principles underlying that. So um, Raju, you are there. So here are two cases: case A and case B. Uh, one is a 41 year old, I don't, and one is a 29 year old patient, case B, but I don't think that makes much difference. But you can see the x rays, both are uh, dysplastics, you can see it's, it's migrated up. Now, my question to you is which is more complex of the two, and, and, uh, and why? And what is your choice of implants, and why? I think uh, the case A is a simpler case because my coverage is good. My, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dysplasia is much lesser than uh, case B. Uh -huh. uh, in ca case B, I think uh, putting the cup is a challenge. I think uh, because uh, my coverage of the cup is a little problem and I must most probably have to medialize to get a good, better coverage. I might have to put the cup a little higher up uh, from the teardrop and then uh, yeah, 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 good, yeah. good point. Adarsh, you are there. Any other uh, points you want to add, Adarsh? Uh, the case B to me looks like, uh, uh, you know, bilateral dysplasia, although it's more subtle on the left side. And if you see the limb length also is not uh, different. But by and large, I agree with everything else which he has said. But we'll have to keep in mind uh, the other side because uh, that will matter about the limb length the equalization. Raju, what about the femoral side, Raju? Uh, femoral side, I think uh, it's a drawer type C on both the sides. I personally feel that I think I need a better view more distally for type uh, uh, case A. But I think uh, 
Uh, okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, you are a junior surgeon. You have access only to standard implants. Uh, which case would you take on? On the on the femoral side. I would do take a regular uh, stem on the type uh, case A. On cement test, uh, sorry. Well, no, it's really the opposite. You can see the uh, if you compare the uh, this where the commonly uh, junior surgeons have a problem. You can see the the offset difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And this so is really and the problem with the offset that's is that. Uh, when they try and uh, there'll be a, a diaphragmal mismatch. So when they're trying to uh, get this low offset in a big stem, they're surely run into problems. Surely they run into problems. Yeah, but this is okay. But you know, but I feel this is an externally rotated uh, uh, hip. So I feel uh, the, the offset. Yeah, so let, let me show you uh, what happened. Uh, not my case. Refer to me for revision, and you can see that uh, the socket has been done fairly well. But he has not been able to handle the situation with the. Um, he tried to sink it very low, and uh, yeah. obviously loose. Uh, the stem was loose when he came for revision. Yeah, so it's a common mistake that, uh, as a general rule, when you see dysplasia, you need to have one of these stems as highlighted earlier. You cannot go in with a normal stem. But whenever you see this offset issues, uh, it's you know craniocaudal offset and diversion. Uh, you have to be a back. There's no excuse for going in without it. Yeah, but here is a classical example of what you should not do. This one is uh, my case. Uh, you know, we discussed the various techniques. As Nikhil said, you can leave a, a good 20-30 percent of the cup uncovered, and there are no issues. Yeah. So these are the, this is the thing that I want to highlight in a in a in a very mild dysplasia. So just because mild dysplasia, don't think it's easy, and don't go in with standard instrument uh, on the on the femoral side. You run into problems. Uh, so many we see of failures. Because the surgeon thought it's, it's in a simple crow one, I can manage. Now there are a lot of things that you don't see on the apex ray, as, as Raju said. Uh, this is um, another example showing again, you know the. Uh, uh, okay, now uh, the point I'm making is that you know when you, um, the commonest stem that we use in India is the cori stem, uh, and then if you see that smallest eight stem that we have is an offset of 38. That is huge, and the minimum head they have is a 1.5. They do not have any minus heads. So may not be uh, applicable to the Caucasian population, but for the Asian population, the, the low offset is a serious problem. And you start with 38, you're almost jammed. You almost cannot accommodate the offset in any of our, forget about dysplasia, even in our standard female patients, you cannot accommodate this uh, low offset. So you need to have a low offset stem. And if you look at the cone walk there, it starts from 27 to, to uh, 38. That's a one centimeter offset difference, huge. So please, please don't get into the trap of uh, falling into, you know, using a standard stem, not only in dysplasia, but also in small patients. The other option is uh, SROM, but again, you have an offset of 30. You need to be in the region of 29, 30 to manage low offset Asian patients. One of the other options uh, are the Karai lookalike uh, implants that many companies have. That was one of the first things we changed when we uh, started using the uh, our Karai lookalike. Uh, was to in the smaller sizes to dramatically reduce the offset and neck lengths. Wow, I'm very happy to hear that, Raymond, because we, it's, a, it's a, such a big problem for us. And uh, the Koray has got a 70% market in India. And, uh, you know, a lot of surgeons run into this problem. And it's good that you made the point that, uh, you know, the Koray is an example of a homothetic stem. That means the, the offset does not vary uh, much depending on the sizes. But in any other stem, it's a non homothetic variety. You will start off with a low offset, and as your size keeps going up, your offset will get bigger and bigger as what it should be. So this Korai, a lot of surgeons don't realize that that point, and uh, we face the problem much more than you do in the U.S., Raymond. Thanks for that. Uh, Vijay, uh, yes, 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 please, Doctor Pachore. Yeah. Vijay, one point. Vijay. The uh, small yes. stems, uh, they have a small offset in a 30 and in a 35. I, I do appreciate that. Other companies do have, but as I said, the Korai is seventy percent of the Indian market, and that's where the problem. I do understand the Zimmer. Not only the Korai does not have a low offset; it starts with a one, one or a one point per head. They don't have any minus. Or I don't know why they designed it like that. But that's how it well, is. I meant, uh, I meant the exit, the cement step. But the problem, of course, is cement. Yes. Yeah. Exit, of course, <laughs> cement <laughs> solves every problem. Uh, I know uh, in your hands, but uh, you know, generally, it's not done in India. And okay, the but small the small point small small and, 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 and low offset, absolutely. Simple stem would any of these uh, challenging situations can be solved very eminently with simple stem, but you need to be good at your technique. That's the only issue. Yeah, so, okay. Yes, Dr. Pachore, yes. 
Yeah, coral stem, the fracture rate on the calcar is very high in the, our country. You must have seen so many patients coming from the periphery operated and they have a lot of uh, uh, fracture rate. Yeah, that is the reason. Yeah, because we are not able to accommodate the low offset. Like the example I showed you, the surgeon is trying to sink the stem lower and lower and lower. He's come to lesser trochanter, but still the offset is got a very tight reduction. So he keeps sinking yeah. down and the calcar breaks. Uh, uh, can, I, can I say something? Yes, Rajesh. Uh, uh, you know, when we do a corral and we do it very frequently, uh, it was not done earlier because uh, one of uh, my seniors, uh, he struggled so much to get the hip in that he swore never to use it again. But I think we take a very low uh, neck cut, you know, almost close to the lesser trochanter, just a couple of millimeters above. And we never have any problem in reducing. Otherwise, if you try to leave too much of a neck in a corral, it can really be a big struggle for the beginners. So I just want to make this point. Yeah, uh, 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 Raymond and Victor can comment on what you said. But the, my, my point is that, uh, you know, if it's a low offset, you must put a low offset stem. You cannot compensate by sinking the stem. That's a height issue. Yeah. Two different yeah. 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 This yeah. problem all started with uh, Mueller. Uh, Mueller was the first to make uh, stems proportional. In other words, if you made a size three in order to uh, and a certain design, and then you just magnify it as you go up in sizes and and reduce it as you go down in sizes, the proportion of neck length and offset and all that uh, changed with respect to the size of the stem. Uh, I, I have always felt this is foolish. Uh, you, just because you have a small canal doesn't mean you have a small bone. And the and the reverse is true as well. Yeah, the, the other point, problem is yeah. with the corral stem. Even if you take a neck, neck cut that is very low, the the place where the stem fits in the femur is determined by the rectangular cross section. So cutting the neck very low does not necessarily mean that the stem will sink lower under unless you undersize the stem. So for me, cutting the neck low does not make that much of a difference. Uh, who is talking, please? Uh, it's Nikhil, sorry. Nikhil, yeah, Nikhil, yeah. Uh, oh, good that, you, that you're using the Korai stem, Nikhil. I'm very happy. <laughs> no, I'm not using it. I'm mainly taking it out. Lots of them. <laughs> but these <laughs> are the problems okay. I've seen. Okay, gentlemen, we'll move on, yeah. Uh, there are a lot to cover, yeah. So now we move on to moderate dysplasia. So we have two situations here, case one and case two. Uh, so that Pachore, uh, yeah. which is uh, the tougher of the two and why? I think the tougher is on the the lateral X-ray on this side is not there, but tougher will be the more on the uh, 31 side uh, old female who has got a yeah, lateral yeah. X-ray. Too much of an uh, antiversion there. The case two is not a. Is, you don't think it would be much of a problem? We are talking about the right side in both the hips, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, yes, I am talking about the right side only. The the if you look at the lateral X-ray, uh, lateral X-ray that is yes. another problem which we have in the this side. And the other side, the 35 year, which don't, we don't have a lateral X-ray, but the problem is going to be the uh, the coxa coxa vara and mushroomed head, and as well as riding trochanter. That is going to be a great problem, great problem for us. Which yes. uh, can I say something? Uh, yes, please, I'll, I'll, yes, have yes. A, I'll have more problem reducing the one in case two, and I might need uh, an osteotomy on the on the uh, in the case two, which I may not need in the case one. I have noticed that both of them are stiff and the shortening is much more on the in the case one. But I think it's the challenge will be to use a stem and reduce it back into the socket and I'll have very low threshold for doing a shortening or shortening. Absolutely what Rajesh said, you know, so uh, much more complex the case too, although the shortening is lesser. Can I, can I say something Dr. Yeah, yes, please. I, yes, please. Uh, for, for, I, I disagree. I think case one is a little more difficult because you have a normal hip on the other side. So you have to make sure you you restore the whole center hip of this hip. On case two, if you do this as a bilateral hip, you can let that uh, high riding uh, cup if you're having troubles to put it uh, put in the cup position. And then you have the options to put both hips at the same time, and you kind of reestablish both hips at the same high, and patient is going to be able to re uh, return to normal quicker. So case one for me is more difficult because you already have a hip on the other side that is normal. I, I, I take your point, Victor, but the thing is, suppose you put a high hip center on the case one, you can always compensate for the lengthening on the femoral side with the appropriate stem. I mean, it doesn't have to come from the socket side. You can still do a high hip center and then uh, uh, compensate for the length on the femoral side. 
uh, the point I'm trying to make is that, like Rajesh said, you know, if you have a, a hip, the head center much below the tip of the great trochanter, it's a great challenge. You cannot leave it like that because they have very poor biomechanics. So you got to keep it up, and then you have this huge soft tissue thing to handle. It's really, really, extremely tough. The more the uh, head center is below the tip of the GT, becomes an extremely difficult situation to handle uh, regarding soft tissues to achieve reduction. And I totally agree with uh, Rajesh as that it would be a much more difficult tip in my hands. So uh, you can see this is the case one. Uh, we have done a high hip center. You can see that I have left my cone Wagner uh, pretty high. And have, although the hip, uh, the socket is on a high hip center, we have managed to achieve leg length quite easily. Uh, whereas this one, this one can be a nightmare. Many times we require, uh, you know, uh, osteotomy, as Rajesh said. They do, if you cannot leave the head below the level of the GT, that will give you poor biomechanics, poor function lifelong. So you got to get the head high. And although the overall shortening is low, this is a much more tougher soft tissue to handle. I totally agree with Rajesh. Okay, and this is the two-year uh, post-op of the X-rays. Okay, so we move on. Dr. Now, Bose, Dr. Dr. Bose, 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 we are really out of time, time, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, comments? Yeah, I'll just show one case. Guru, yeah, I'm all right. We'll skip yeah, this one. Yeah. Vijay, you can take another five minutes. Oh, oh great. Um, so two more cases. Yeah, then yeah. So um, quickly now. Um, uh, who's in the panel, Doctor um, Vibhian Prasad? A case, um, you have a case C and a case D here. Yes, I think uh, case uh, six, case C is a crow uh, four, clear cut crow, crow, crow uh, Maybe crow my four. question is wrong. Uh, is the principles of management same or the principles of management little different? Uh, principles of management little bit different. Yeah, the what is, what's the difference? What's the difference? Number one, number one, the bone stock is in natural. Case C, let us think. Let me not confuse case C. In the case C, we have to go the cup in the natural estabulum. We yes. have to keep because bone stock is there good. And it definitely requires a shortening osteotomy so that we have to develop the offset properly. Then only dislocation will not occur. So it is a classical case for putting a small cup in a good bone stock in a natural or a normal estabulum and then sorting our chatomy and keeping a, some modular stem like S from or something like that or cone wagner probably S snob is the best one. Yeah. Coming uh, so to case uh, yeah. D, he had the soft offset and also lot of soft tissue contracture. Here two things are there. One is shortening associated with soft tissue contracture also. It requires a lot of soft tissue dissection. Absolutely. Probably absolutely. anteriorly and posteriorly. Then we can make a trial reduction, then we have to decide. Regarding yeah. shorting osteotomy, I will keep it standby and I will try to reduce if possible with soft tissue, soft tissue release only. If not come, then I will I, go I for will, I'll tissue. give you a 10 on 10 for that, Dr. Prasad. Absolutely. Uh, right. uh, golden right. words. Absolutely right. Uh, so, the uh, the case um, C is uh, dominantly subprochantic tightness like in a crow 4 where the muscle tightness is... Uh, so, with the, usually in a subprochantic tightness, the head is above the level of the GT and there's a well-formed... Uh, there's no well-formed pseudostabulum. And then the uh, lesser token is much above the level of the teardrop. And these is a mobile hip exercise. You almost need no release. You just have to do a subprochantric osteotomy and everything falls into place. In contrast, here it is a post septic hip. Looks like a crow 4, but it's not a crow 4, where the predominantly supratrochantric uh, fibrosis is there. So the real technique is not a subprochantric osteotomy, but release, 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 keep on releasing. And how do you find this? Head is usually below the level of the GT. Uh, there is a well formed pseudostablum. And the lesser trochanter is almost at the level of the uh, teardrop. These are the things, the stiff hip, fibrous ankylosis, and the extensive release is the, as Dr. Prasad said, is the subprochantric osteotomy will be the last resort. The release is the first thing. So if you go initially and try a subprochantric osteotomy, you will not achieve anything. So two important principles to make. And we are not in a subprochantric osteotomy in this case. So this is the last case. This is what we call the double complex primary. We know all complex primary. We saw in uh, Rajesh's presentation. And here's a patient with a crow 4 type hip. But now she's got an osseous ankylosis. And she is in her 30s, I think. Yeah. Rajesh. Rajesh there? Yeah, I am uh, yeah, I'm here. Actually, I was just muted. So uh, that's that's very uh, interesting. So um, um, I would again like to uh, there are issues of uh, severe shortening. And yes. uh, that uh, will remain for some time after the surgery. Um, you will. I would like to put the cup, you know, where the best bone is, somewhere here. 
and uh, I would actually again use uh, an SROM kind of uh, modular stem uh, because uh, there is a very wide canal here and uh, I would uh, like to adjust the limb length and version and uh, so I'll use an SROM with a, a porous coated cup with a bone at the best position do an adductor chinotomy and explain to the patient that the limb length discrepancy will reduce over a period of time as the as the yes. uh, yeah, nice. Victor, you want to? Uh, what would be your idea, Victor? Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So, what I will do here, this is one of those very complex cases that I normally join my uh, uh, surgeons from trauma. I will correct the hip and then probably try to put the cup as normal as possible, um, and then extra articular do a lengthening of that leg uh, either with a bone transfer and try to correct uh, if there's any other uh, deformities at that point we can correct with uh, correct theotomy. Nikhil, uh, your thoughts on that quickly? So because it has happened at 6, it is not such an easy thing to do. It is not just a bony problem but there is a likely to be a lot of soft tissue contractures in this and I'll have to think carefully about which soft tissues I need to release. The other problem in these is that because it has been since the age of 6, the sciatic nerve is very very short and there is a limit in how much lengthening you can do. So it might be one where when you do your hip, you might need to consider an osteotomy of the femur both to valgize the femur and also to shorten the length. Shorten the, you want to shorten the femur? Huh? Yeah, if, if, you, if you take a valgus okay, wedge okay, off, you'll be able to correct please, the deformity. Please, 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 please. Okay. Yeah, okay. These are the clinical pictures. And this is the immediate post-op that we did and as the sciatic nerve is uh, very tight as Nikhil said you want to leave the hip high but that's where you decompress the sciatic nerve to an extent and this is uh, about three months follow-up. Uh, she's still a little short but she's able to manage with a show race on this side yeah. Okay so gentlemen thanks very much for your valuable contribution I'm sure the audience learned a lot. Thanks again for the opportunity and thanks uh, for the faculty. Give a big hand to the faculty. Thanks, thanks very Vijay. much. Vijay Thank stay you. back. Yeah. Stay back Vijay. Yeah yeah we'll do we'll do yeah. yeah. I invite uh, Shekhar to take over. And once again, thanks for all the panelists for a wonderful session. I would think that this take and should take one, one and a half hour. But unfortunately, we got to cover so many things. And great show. And uh, off to Shekhar. And Indrajit is there in the panel. Indrajit, raise your hand. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> we were trying to hunt Indrajit since morning. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Good, good. Uh, right, Shekhar. Yes. Uh, of yours. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, very much. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, and to this, uh, and welcome to this uh, extraordinary meeting of 2021. And uh, I will be moderating this uh, session on ankylosing protrusio hip. So let me see how do I get my slides. Every time there is something new happens here. Yeah, Shaker. Yeah, Nikhil is the keynote man. So. I know Nikhil is the keynote speaker. So you want to talk so, about it? Okay. Good. No, no. I just wanted to make sure, uh, make sure that uh, I introduce Nikhil properly. Uh, so, the, uh, but I can't get my slides on. <laughs> just a sec. Yeah, I got it. Good. Don't you know Nikhil knows no needs no introduction? That's sure, good. I know. You don't need it. <laughs> uh, where is it? Screen. Sir, I've given you a slide, sir. You can use this, sir. Sure. Yeah. We can see it now, sir. All right. Okay. I'll use this one then. So, well, we all know Nikhil has been coming to India repeatedly for uh, uh, doing pelvic acetabular courses and uh, it's been a great uh, uh, visit for him and uh, as well as for us. Uh, he's a consultant, orthopedic surgeon, a hip and knee surgeon at the famous Wrightington Hospital uh, where I had the chance to be registrar uh, way back in 1985. So his particular interest is in complex and primary hip and knee replacement and revisions. And uh, his passion is for pelvic acetabular surgery as well. So over to you, Nikhil, to talk to us on practical tips for young hip surgeons in dealing with complex hip arthroplasty. Nikhil. Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes we can. That's great. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a privilege to be part of any conference in India. Uh, and it's always a very difficult job when you have to follow Rajesh Malhotra and Vijay Bose and uh, the doyens of uh, Indian orthopedics. 
So uh, the remit of my talk is to try and cover the practical tips that are important for a young hip surgeon. And uh, these tips are very applicable for myself because I still consider myself very young. So why, uh, the, the way I cover this is to first describe why a total hip replacement can be complex. And we've already seen several reasons why that might be. Uh, the prerequisites and the planning that is required, some principles and techniques, and then look at some case examples. So what is it that makes a hip complex? It may be the characteristics of the patient, like obesity or very short stature, neuromuscular problems like polio or cerebral palsy, a skin and soft tissue conditions like scars, heterotopic ossification, over sepsis or plastic surgery, and then deformity of the bone because of uh, dysplasia, ankylosis, uh, sepsis, or trauma. Other reasons may be because of deformity in the femur itself. Uh, previous surgery like metalwork can make it quite complex or if there are flaps around the hip because of previous trauma and plastic surgery. And finally, let us never forget that surgeon characteristics can make the hip quite complex. Uh, Vijay showed some cases where surgeons have attempted to do a complex operation but unfortunately it has failed and so these, there, these are also important factors. When we start off doing or planning for a complex total hip, it is very important to do a very detailed and meticulous clinical assessment and understand the medical and the clinical pictures uh, that present. It's very important to also understand the, the role of diabetes and obesity and uh, similar uh, uh, medical factors because it is not just that your, your, your good technique that will determine a good outcome, but it is also the patient characteristics. Uh, managing the expectations of the patient in a complex uh, setting is important. And then you have to ask yourself whether we have the right facility, the right equipment, the right staff and, right, and the right plan to execute that procedure. So I consider Clint Eastwood my spiritual guru and every quote that he has given in um, his movies actually is uh, uh, an important truth in life. And uh, for those who haven't read this book by Uttam uh, Shirarkar, who works in Birmingham, Cognitive Simulation, I would definitely recommend that you read this book. And he talks about how we can mentally train ourselves to improve our surgical performance. So coming back to Planet now, it's very important uh, setting off with a complex total hip to make a good preoperative plan. Um, important to get limb length x-rays and make sure that you are aware of your length, your offset issues, uh, the prosthesis that you are going to use. And what a plan does is it allows you to rehearse the whole operation in your mind before you actually do it. I find CT scan planning very helpful in complex cases because they allow measurement of the sizes. And we saw in some other cases how small the acetabulum is and how small the femur is. And I find CT scan templating much more accurate in determining the sizes of the prosthesis. Now we also have access to a lot of custom uh, bespoke software planning like Materialize or Symbios and it gives us fantastic plan. You know where the bone density is, where the bone is strong, where the bone is weak and it really helps you to plan the operation. Now we have a 3D printer on site. So for this patient who has Down syndrome and you can see that she has a very bent femur with metal work, you can actually manufacture a 3D model and perform the operation in a workshop before you actually do it in a real patient. And this is a tremendous advantage now that we have with 3D printing. Once we have done that, I like to make a surgical tactic, which is basically a step-by-step -step rehearsal of the whole operation that I'm going to do. And then I rehearse it with my nurse as well. So she knows plan A, plan B, plan Z. Plan the approach, the positioning, how you're going to handle the sciatic nerve, whether you're going to release the gluteus maximus tendon, uh, the, the difficulties that you might encounter with dislocation of the hip, whether there's any plan lengthening. Uh, Vijay spoke in detail about the stepwise reaming. And if you have a tight femur, how are you going to deal with that? Soft tissue releases or by doing shortening. So these are the standard steps I think that apply for all complex total hip replacements. Um, I've trained as a pelvic and acetabular surgeon and as a hip surgeon. And one of the things that you learn in the acetabular uh, fixation surgery is that the first thing you identify is the sciatic nerve and then the hip looks after itself. So these are the steps that I always do. Release the gluteus maximus tendon and then you measure the length before the hip is dislocated. And once your hip is dislocated, try and get a 360 degree exposure with good soft tissue release. So the remit of this talk was to discuss on protrusio and on ankylosis. So let's go to protrusio now. Commonly, it is an idiopathic cause, but you can get metabolic problems. I see a lot of traumatic protrusio because of the nature of my practice. 
and then I'll show you one or two interesting cases of iatrogenic protrusio. So this is a typical um, auto pelvis. The uh, head is migrated medially, and um, your your center of rotation is moved inwards. So we have a technique that was described at Wrightington many years ago with good long-term results. And my preferred technique is to do impaction bone grafting of the floor and then to use a cemented socket. Even if you use an uncemented socket, it's perfectly reasonable. But what is important is to bone graft the medial acetabulum and to bring your hip out where it should be. Failure is linked to absence of bone grafting. Uh, dislocation can be quite tricky in some of these uh, say, uh, cases and a safe and a gentle dislocation is required. It's very rare that you will need an inside to cut for a protrusio but in very severe cases of protrusio where the head is migrated literally inside the pelvis you might need to do an inside to neck cut. So this is the way I do my impaction bone grafting. When you're cutting your neck uh, you cut it in the form of slices so it makes it easy to prepare the bone graft using a nibbler. I like to prepare my bone graft with, with hand using the Nijmegen technique and then you wash the bone graft. Make sure that you get good exposure to the acetabulum. You pack the bone graft in with firm impactions until you get this uh, wonderful cobblestone appearance and then you can cement your socket into that and that's the x-ray at 10 years. You can see how beautifully the bone graft has healed. The socket sits where it wants to sit with excellent radiological outcome and good clinical outcome. The next um, part of the talk is ankylosis. So let's look at some cases where the hip is basically stiff because of fibrous ankylosis or bony ankylosis. So this is typically ankylosing spondylitis. It's not as severe as the one that uh, Rajesh Malhotra showed or the one that Vijay showed. We don't really get that much ankylosing spondylitis nowadays over here and maybe it is because of uh, the, the vastly improved uh, immunological medicines that the rheumatologists are uh, using. And I certainly don't see the ankylosing spondylitis here that I see in India when, when you guys present. But anyway, the difficulty here is again positioning. You have to think of the cervical spine of the patient, whether he needs flexible endoscopic intubation. Um, I routinely obtain an MRI scan to look at the abductor status because clinical examination may not be that accurate. If you have a windswept pelvis, then it is better to position the patient on the adducted side uh, downwards first and operate on the abductor side first if you are going to do it simultaneously or like Rajesh you can do it with an anterior approach. The exposure is important, often the bone can be soft, intraoperative fractures can happen, a safe dislocation and an inside to neck cut is uh, relevant and sometimes what I do is make two parallel neck cuts and then take a little uh, disc of bone out from the neck and that allows you uh, very good exposure. And then you have to find the true floor and the true inferior wall before you commence your reaming. And that is the x-ray at five years following um, bilateral cemented total hip replacements. Some other case examples of protrusio and of ankylosis. So this is uh, similar to the case that we saw with extensive protrusion on the uh, medial side of the right hip and treated with impaction bone grafting. And you can see the first x-ray on the left is the appearance at six weeks. And the second x-ray on the right is the appearance at 9 months. And you can see how rapidly the bone graft incorporates and you basically get normal restoration of your, of your bone stock. One of the things that Raymond mentioned is always think of the second operation. And our philosophy at Wrightington Hospital is to make your revision look like a primary, not make your primary look like a revision. So every attempt when you do a hip replacement should be combined with restoring the bone stock so you get ready for the next operation in 15-20 years or whenever. So this is what I meant by iatrogenic protrusio, uh, aggressive reaming of the floor of the acid villum. That's the immediate post-op x-ray and in three weeks the cup has sunk completely inside and uh, many times these cups are now sitting on the vasculature. So for these I would obtain a CT angiogram just to make sure if the blood vessels are near the cup and usually my vascular surgeon is in the coffee room just in case uh, we need his help. In this case, again, I've reconstructed with a lot of impaction bone grafting using an augment and this is a trivicular metal cup. Now you would wonder why I don't use meshes and uh, we believe that meshes actually uh, interfere with uh, the neovascularization. So I just keep capping, uh, packing a bone graft using uh, multiple femoral heads. In this case, I use two femoral heads, the obturator internus muscle that sits on the quadrilateral plate of your acetabulum uh, works as your restraint and you keep packing it until it stops and then you can use uh, whichever cup you want. The advantage of this is that once the acetabulum heals, 
you are ready for the next operation if ever required in the next 20 years. This was a case I inherited of an acetabular non-union. Uh, this patient came from abroad um, and uh, this non-union was about uh, two years old I think. You can see how widely displaced the inferior fragment is and the femoral head has become uh, uh, migrated medially with protrusio and this was reconstructed in two stages. In the first stage, you mobilize the columns, bone graft it and fix it and once it heals at three months, you go for a total hip replacement and that is the follow-up at five years with a well-healed uh, protrusio from acetabular non-union. That looks like almost like a primary hip. Uh, this is classically the ankylosing spondylitis uh, type case, but this was a surgically performed arthrodesis many years ago, treated with uh, hip spica. In these cases, depending on how the surgery was done, will determine how much abductors are left and, um, and how you handle it. So in this case, we have done a trochanteric osteotomy that gives a very good exposure. You can find the true uh, floor without any difficulty, and that is the follow-up at about 11 years. This was another case of acetabular non-union. This non-union was uh, four decades, so almost 40 years old, and the patient had never walked for four decades. He was in a wheelchair. The hip was stiff and ankylosed uh, because of a failed attempt to perform an arthrodesis, and then the screw broke inside the acetabulum, and the patient also had a foot drop. So this was a very challenging case. That is the exposure. Uh, I had to do a lot of soft tissue release before the hip could be dislocated. Then the non-union was mobilized, uh, bone grafted, metal work was taken out, fixation and a one-stage total hip replacement with a cemented socket. A lot of people always ask me how do, does the osteotomy heal or how does the non-union heal with cement. When you have a coating of bone graft, that's never a problem. And you can also uh, bone graft the medial uh, side of the acetabulum or the quadrilateral plate uh, inside the pelvis and that is an x-ray at 10 years follow-up. You can see it looks you know pretty much like it was uh, on day one. This was an ankylosis because of heterotopic ossification again post-traumatic. Uh, some of the things with heterotopic ossification is that they bleed quite a lot and it is very important to find the correct plane between the bone and the ectopic bone and then between the ectopic bone and the nerve and I trace the nerve all the way into the pelvis through the greater sciatic notch before I start taking down the heterotopic ossification carefully. And many times the abductor muscle is full of heterotopic ossification and you have to be really, really careful that the abductor muscle is not damaged. And this was a chronic dislocation. Uh, the patient had a fracture dislocation of the acetabulum and this was uh, treated conservatively. So what happened is, not only was the femoral head incarcerated in the supraacetabular portion of the pelvis, but also the malunited portions of the wall had healed quite solidly with the lateral border of the ileum almost two inches above the hip joint. It One of the things with these <coughs> cases, your superior gluteal neurovascular bundle comes very close to where you are operating and it can bleed and then retract into the pelvis. So you have to handle this very carefully and there is usually a large posterior superior segmental defect. So this was a young person and my preferred technique to reconstruct a segmental defect in a young person is using a structural graft. If the structural graft is mainly superior, then you don't need a posterior column plate to buttress it because there are no shear forces. Uh, they are predominantly compressive forces. But in this case, because the defect was posterior and superior, I used uh, the autograft from the femoral head and then plated it underneath this column plate. Then you ream into it and you effectively make a new acetabulum for the patient and then you can put whichever cup you want to put. In this case, I've just put a cemented cup and you can see the result at four years. Nikhil, Nikhil, can you? Yes. Yeah, we are running out of time. I think. Uh, okay, you know, so the last case, this yeah, was okay. a bent femur treated with a dome osteotomy and with an SROM uh, to good healing. So in terms of uh, complexity, it is very important to have meticulous planning. Uh, do the surgery in your mind first. For my practice, there is a huge role of bone grafting and variety of different techniques used in trauma and in acetabular surgery. Uh, thank you. Shekhar, you got 20 yeah. minutes to go. Yeah. 20 minutes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah all the panel, they were running at 20 minutes late, but don't worry, the quality of discussion is so good, we can stay up to 10 o'clock. So, next 20 minutes is your Shekhar. Yeah. Just.
I don't know where. My... Peter, can you help me to get my screen on? Uh, sir, just go on to the PowerPoint, sir. If it's uh, a PowerPoint. <coughs> you have a PowerPoint, sir? We are seeing your screen. So you have to start the uh, the uh, slides. Shekhar, you reduce your... Uh, yeah, minimize that, sir. Minimize your uh, Zoom. Yes, sir. Okay. Now and then you open your PowerPoint. Yeah, meanwhile, there is a question. Roll of Jumbo Cup. Uh, one of you can take it before Shaker comes on with slides. Raymond, roll of Jumbo Cup from Sham Professor. Okay. Zoom. Now yeah. go back to Zoom. No, sir, he's on the Zoom, sir. No problem. Now just go to the slideshow, sir. Just go to the slideshow at the bottom. At the bottom, sir. No, sir. On the on the on the PowerPoint. Yeah. 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 The full screen. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think Nikhil gave a great talk and covered all the very important points regarding ankylos and protrusio hip and he showed great cases. So what I'm going to do is take you through a couple of cases, uh, one on uh, ankylos hip and one on protrusio so that we highlight those points all over again over a clinical case uh, so that uh, the attendees really benefit from this session. So we all understand that uh, these ankylos hips can be very, very challenging. Uh, we know that this is inflammatory disorder involving the spine, the sacroiliac joints, the uh, hips, which could be, you know, in as many as 90% of cases could be bilateral with flexion deformities, soft tissue contractures, and uh, uh, abduction on one side, adduction on the other side, maybe involving even the knee joints. Uh, these could be challenges regarding anesthesia because of difficult airway, then difficult intubation because of a fixed cervical spine, and uh, even the lumbar spine could be fixed, there could be an Anderson lesion. So you are really worried about these patients. Respiratory problems could include uh, difficult uh, expansion of the lung with atelectasis. Uh, there could be cardiac defects also. And uh, as far as surgeons are concerned, there are many, many challenges that we have faced, uh, especially if a bilateral hip is uh, concerned. So here I will take you through this first case of mine, which is a third, uh, which I operated in 2013 so that I have about a uh, eight year follow up on this patient. So this was a 16 year old male who presented to me at that point in time, bilateral ankylosed hip with genu valgum and internal rotation deformity. So here he is with uh, uh, with a uh, fixed adduction deformity on one side, fixed abduction deformity on the other side. And you can see his uh, knees are also fixed with the uh, uh, internal rotation deformity and genu valgum. So I would uh, now take you, this is his clinical picture. Uh, and this is how, uh, the, and uh, I will show you his gait. This is how he walked. Let's come on to the panel. We have a great panel with uh, Rajesh Marotra and uh, and even uh, Dr. Pachore, who have uh, published extensively that series of more than 300 cases with them. Then we have Vijay Bose and Nikhil Shah. So I think we have a great panel here to answer some questions. So uh, uh, in this case, uh, Rajesh, if I may start with you, uh, would you like to do both hips first or both knees first, ipsilateral hip and knee or all joints individually? And if so, which joint first, the abducted side or the adducted side? So uh, uh, that's a very interesting case. It looks dysplastic, you know. I mean, he is some form of uh, syndromic, uh, this thing. And uh, I would uh, start with both hips together. And uh, I think I will, uh, and, and talking about which side to go first, uh, Nikhil has already said, if you're doing by, going by posterior approach, it's always better to uh, do the adducted side later. So I'll have the left side up and do the left side first and then go to the right side. Okay, so the point well taken that you would... Uh position the patient in lateral position and do the abducted side first and then turn over the patient to do the adducted side then. Is that, uh, is that the message we want to give to the audience? Exactly. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so let's then come to the positioning. So, we talked of positioning that we do the abducted side, uh, the, the abducted hip on the top and then do that first. So, regarding the exposure, uh, what is your, uh, Vijay, your approach for doing uh, these hips? Uh, 
uh, what sort of approach do you have a posterior approach for all or anterior or dual approach or a uh, slide uh, i would do a um, posterior approach for all and if uh, there is a problem in exposing the neck i would do a post reduction osteotomy of the greater trochanter and then if still i can't get then i do a dual approach so it goes in sequence start with the posterior and see how it goes okay so uh, it's just that uh, it's easier to do anterior approach for hips with external rotation deformities uh, posterior approach of course for hips with internal rotation deformities you can do a trochanteric slide osteotomy if you have some difficulty or you can even do a dual approach as our friend dr bosley has described so i think this is regarding the exposure the femoral neck osteotomy with uh, nickel alluded to during his presentation uh, i think uh, nickel can you repeat that again so that uh, we understand it little better so yes yeah, so you identify the neck very carefully make sure that you put some homans forceps on the superior and the inferior edge of the neck so when you cut it you are not going to cut it into the acetabulum and this is where i find it very useful to palpate the anterior part of the neck just like professor bosley has described formally a dual hip approach i only came to know that what we were doing for a number of years actually has got a name because it's quite easy to just go anterior to the abductors palpate your anterior neck and make sure that when you're cutting it you can cut it carefully with a jiggly saw in those cases that are really difficult and you cannot get the femur to translate i make two thin parallel cuts and you try and take that slice out in between and that allows the femur to translate anteriorly the important thing is not to go into the acetabulum is very easy i mean i've had cases where they've made the osteotomy into the acetabulum so i think that is a very very important point so that the first cut is in direction perpendicular to the neck as near to the acetabulum as possible and then the second cut is from the trochanteric fossa to the to first to 1 cm above the lesser trochanter So you remove the slice of bone, and then you get some working space to work in between. So, what are your tricks to identify the acetabulum? Is Vijay on the line, or if not, then Rajesh may may you take over? No, yeah, I'm I'm, yeah. yeah Rajesh, Rajesh is there. Vijay is there. Okay, Vijay. Yeah. So, so some tricks to identify the two acetabulum. Uh, so, in all these cases, the spontaneous fusion, you have the uh, you know the palmar fat pad there. In many cases, you are able to see the transacetabulum ligament as well. So you, these are the landmarks for finding the true acetabulum for me. Okay, so triangulating the three vital surgical landmarks: obturator I mean, inferiorly, the sciatic knot posteriorly, the pubic bone or anterior inferior iliac spine superiorly. Anteriorly, sorry. Uh, and then you can also Say yes, please. Landmark is what you describe. You trace the greater sciatic notch to the ischial spine. and then you trace the ischial spine to the ischial tuberosity because we do that all the time in acetabular fixations right and on the x ray that will show you where the inferior wall is so you can plan it that way also so that is how often do you use intraoperative imaging uh, do this uh, uh, ankylosed hips dr shekhar it's very cumbersome if i am using uh, imaging in a posterior approach in lateral position it means i think i'm really in some kind of trouble or i want to rule out some mess up otherwise it's very unwieldy it uh, is i i'm not happy about the uh, compromise of the sterility so the uh, i think what uh, what hints you were asking for looking for the tail or looking for the pulvinar which is always there uh, is actually what uh, we can do by experience and hardly ever do in uh, that is what we are coming to yeah so you will always find the pulvinar fat on the foveal soft tissue and an incomplete gray ossifying cartilage and that should give you to the that that should lead you to the to acetabulum dr shekhar i just uh, can i just say one thing yes please again uh, last four uh, bony ankylosis which are done by direct anterior approach i think uh, i if i put up the x rays i don't think it's possible to get such an ideal up position ever uh, without radiology in a lateral position so i think if if the deformity is not very severe it's bony ankylosis uh now i'll have a, a a sort of temptation to go by direct anterior purely for the reason of imaging now now that you mentioned it yeah thank okay. you Shekhar. thank you sir yes yes the yeah, nothing this uh, what described by nikhil that is uh, taking out the wedge that is called as uh, actually you have to take out a larger wedge 
that is called a napkin ring osteotomy because if you try to rotate that hip you will get a spiral fracture so you yes. need a space to take out the head, uh, up head that is another thing and regarding image i think you are you uh, rarely required only in a patient who are surgically fused and you are not able to identify the area that is the only time probably our, our last 10 10 year 10 years coming here i must have done at least only twice or thrice maximum that is the only time you get an image when well, it's a rarity to get surgically fused hips anymore yeah. you may get it after a septic hip uh, in childhood but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not any more fusions at all. But the septic ankylos, that is the time you might require. Very rarely you require the require just to guide. You may be correct. Most of the time you are correct because once you put an inferior retractor just below the whatever the structure are uh, structure are, then you will be able to identify and start rimming from that area. Uh, any tips uh, regarding uh, uh, acetabular inclination, uh, Rajesh? so that is a very tricky thing and i'm glad that you asked must make sure that the table is horizontal because the anesthetists move it and you have actually drawn so beautifully uh, you know if it's a fixed spinal pelvic uh, deformity where the sacroiliac joint is fused and the uh, and the uh, pelvis uh, the spine is scoliotic and fused in that position i would put it in optimum position but if it is a arthrosis or a fusion which will correct in a uh, uh, in a uh, raised hemi pelvis i'll try to put it more uh, vertical and slightly more antiverted and in a pelvis which is lower down i'll put it in a little more horizontal and little less antiversion so if you have an adduction deformity i would like to avoid a horizontal cup because once that gets corrected the cup will become even more horizontal exactly and that will that will uh, reduce the range of movement of that hip about an abduction deformity uh, dr nikhil sorry can you just say that again your so, so if you, if the if the patient has an abduction deformity uh, would that uh, change your inclination of the cup or i want to how do you factor in the inclination of your cup i uh, know i tend to follow the natural acetabulum that i find i tend not to try and be too clever about changing the inclination because you're second guessing what the position is going to be when the patient stands up and you're second guessing how much your pelvic obliquity is going to be corrected when you do a bilateral would you not avoid a vertical cup in that situation um we, you plan it preoperatively and then yes. uh, once you have positioned your patient on the side i try to draw the lines uh, on my spine the posterior superior iliac spine and in my mind i try and estimate how much pelvic obliquity there is once the patient has been positioned and then you just built it into your antiversion and with a bit of experience you generally tend to get it plus minus 5 degrees where you want to be i don't Quick, use x very quickly i will get on to the choice of implant uh, uh, i mean obviously from writington you would use cemented implants uh, but uh, what about the indian panel dr pachore what is your choice of implants I mean, nowadays uh, constrained liners and dual mobilities No, no, no. It's uncemented. Young patient, uh, not dolmen. Just uh, if I'm going to use 32 and 36, I am don't want to go under double mobility or anything. Uh, I hardly use any constraint liner. Only double uh, dual mobility in a very high risk patients. Uh, high risk patient. Otherwise, by and large, it is straightforward uncemented uncemented implant. Shaker, Ajay, any Shaker. comment? Different. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So. Shaker. So these days, yes, yes, yes. Indrajit is there in the panel. I don't know whether. Oh, I can't see him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, Indrajit. I I can't see you on the screen. Indrajit is very much there on that. Nah. Yeah. So uh, can I complete, sir? What? Yeah, please, Rajesh. Go ahead. So uh, my choice, if the patient is affording, I'll choose one of the uh, modern porous coated uh, shelf, and uh, I would prefer a multi hole cup because many times, if I'm not happy with the bone quality, like. unlike nikhil we don't use cemented cups in these young patients uh, so i would like to put in a screw in the pubis or in the ischium so i would prefer a, a you know a gripsion kind of cup or uh, you know a, a porous coated multi hole cup for these okay so uh, very I, rarely can i say you the constraint liner dual mobility is uh, yeah. very seldom no. and choice of cemented or uncemented or hybrid is individual performance depending on the Type of case one is dealing with the kind of bone one has uh, at his hand and the kind of defect one has to take care of. So I will quickly move on because time is short. I'm sorry, who else is Guru on the panel the apart from the, because I can't. I can't Raymond is there. Raymond is there. Victor is oh, there. Oh dear. Oh dear. I'm terribly sorry. I, I, I wanna. I wanna add a couple of points. Um, 
I, I we uh, here in the United States, uh, it has become very popular the anterior approach. And on these cases, I it's 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 one case that I will consider the anterior approach because you have fluoroscopy during you can use fluoroscopy during surgery to cut position. You can try different position. You have the ability. I don't use the table, so when you don't use the table, you can have plenty of range of motion and test this hip um, in all positions to make sure it's uh, it's in good position. So anterior approach for these cases, I, I feel it's one of the re uh, reasons why uh, it, it provides some advantage in, in cases like this. Okay. So uh, I'll move on to the next uh, issue of how about soft tissue releases. Now that I can see Raymond, uh, Raymond I can ask you, uh, what are the issues of soft tissue releases that you would do in these hips? Raymond, unmute yourself. Unmute. Raymond, yeah. I'm afraid to unmute myself. I'm dizzy from this case. <coughs> um, uh, I really don't have a whole lot of experience with these kind of cases. Yeah, Indrajit? Indrajit, unmute. Unmute, Indrajit. Yeah, Indrajit, unmute. Yeah. Adapter tenotomy, obviously, if there's an adduction contracture, definitely. And uh, if you're doing the anterior ap approach, or the, uh, what we do is the anterolateral approach. It's so occasionally you need to uh, release the aggressors very badly. In one of the cases, uh, the most easiest way of doing it, of course, would be taking it off the bone. But if you are in trouble and if you are not very sure as to the iliosaurus, remembering that it goes below the lesser trochanter also, you can take a little bit of the lesser trochanter off and that will release the flexion contraction. As for the reduction, the, uh, as you have said over here, the trochanteric fragment, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, reduction, but if it is that, then you can go through the trochanter and then wire it back in, in the approach. Dr. Shekhar, can I make a quick comment? All right. Uh, uh, we, we rarely get these patients with an extension contracture and we have published in Journal of Arthroplasty in our technique of Z-plasty of G-max uh, in these kind of cases because after you replace them, you still don't get flexion because of G-max contracture. Okay, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, but before I just show my case, uh, I think one point that we haven't highlighted if anybody would like to take it on, uh, if patient has a, a severe lumbar kyphosis as well as uh, uh, ankylosed hips, uh, which uh, issue would be addressed first? Nikhil, you want to take that on? Now, you have a spine unit in Wrightington? No, we have it in Salford and uh, I tend to discuss it with them, but uh, I've never had cases of such severity in ankylosing spondylitis where we've had to debate uh, hip versus spine. Like I said, uh, we, don't, we just don't get these severe cases. Dr. Pajore? Yeah, if, uh, you, have, you have to take a good lateral x-ray. If the, the, the deformity is very high and as well as more than 30 to 40 degrees of spinopelvic parameters or uh, problem, then you have to take the first is the spine surgeon and then do your hips. Then do your hips. That is the main uh, important part of it. Otherwise, the hips will dislocate after, this, uh, after your uh, surgeries. Uh, Victor, you Victor, want to add two minutes to move forward? Okay. Yes? You got two minutes to go. Two minutes, all right. So I'll quickly show. So uh, what I did in this patient, I did uh, uh, hybrid hips. Uh, I did the right side and the, 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 sorry, the left side and then the right side. And I did the, after doing the hip, I did a cemented stem so that I could correct whatever versions I could using the cemented stem. But uh, I still had problems on the uh, distal fever. So we did the corrective osteotomy. And uh, so one side done. And then uh, a week later, we went and do, did the other side. And this is what the X-rays looked like after surgery. This is how he's walking six weeks post-op. And... Uh, and this is how I asked him to send me a, a clip on his mobile. So this is how he's walking eight years after surgery. And this is uh, his uh, follow-up x-ray eight years after surgery. So uh, we have talked of this. Uh, ah, just a quick question from uh, Vijay. Any role of resurfacing anymore at, in these patients? Certainly not in these patients. 
but in the ideal you know big male patient who is super active there is a role for resurfacing which i continue to do but certainly okay. not for complex cases and things no role for resurfacing and and you do biomet uh, the the bubbling in web coming am bhr yeah no other no other way no other okay uh, any prophylaxis heterotopic calcification prophylaxis I think we are regularly regularly using endometriosid uh, at least for four to six weeks if the creatinine levels are normal and if the if there are contraindication. I think single dose radiation has been well uh, well documented in the literature and as well as we have been using it 700 rad next day morning, uh, 350 from the front and 350 from the back. Uh, it's called linear accelerator only in the capsule area. Capsule area. Very well said. prognosis i think the uh, prognosis is poor if arthrodesis is before puberty uh, and there is underdeveloped hip and the greater trochanter or there is a lack of abductor mechanism so i think i will just uh, end over here by saying that we should be giving realistic expectations to our patients patients who could be walking independently before hip replacement there is a 50% chance that they may have to use cane and uh, their uh, uh, their uh, function may not be as comparable to those who have hip replacement from an arthritic hip otherwise so with this i would conclude my session thank you very much for having me and a wonderful discussion that we have had in this session thank you so much thank you so much uh, shekhar and that uh, concludes the first session let me uh, congratulate and thank raymond uh, for giving a keynote vijay bose and nikhil shah and uh, for conducting excellent all the three sessions the orchestrators rajesh malhotra vijay bose and shekhar agarwal and the esteemed panel vijay bose rajesh malhotra pachore indrajit sartar victor hernandez raymond robinson nikhil shah ashok raj and vibhav prasad so it's a wonderful and thanks especially to raymond and victor i can see victor is in the operating theater with uh, everything on and uh, please join us we got two more days any time you just got you can come in and chip into us and it's a pleasure to have you thank you so much now we will move on to leo joseph the secretary who will give the secretary report and then is registry update ashok rajgopal will give you and then we will move to research in arthroplasty by mohit bandari thank you so much i i have to apologize i have to leave i'm sorry for that so okay, can you got some okay. Okay. okay thank you okay Whoever wants to stay, they can stay back. Welcome. Yeah, Leo. Uh, sir, do you see my screen, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, at the outset, I should thank Dr. Guruva for the wonderful sessions uh, that he has planned for the for us for the last for the next three days. We have had a very tough time in the last one year. and we had to go through very difficult decisions because of the cancellation of the uh, huge and humongous program that dr kuruva already had planned for in hyderabad the last year because of which uh, uh, we we have had a lot of disappointments because we couldn't conduct the meeting now uh, it's it's a privilege and an honor to be the secretary of this wonderful organization which is involved in a lot of good work in orthopedics i should uh, at the outset begin by welcoming all the new members that who have who have joined the indian society of hip and knee surgeons uh, over the last uh, one year and a half we have had 97 members who have joined us and uh, seven of our members have been upgraded to life membership uh, the, the list of the members uh, are dr. here dr dr leo could you go full screen please sorry could we go full screen please screen uh, you are on the slide sort of view okay am i okay now thank you sir yes. yes sorry about that so these are the uh, these are the new members who have joined us and their details now uh, as you are all aware the indian society of hip and knee surgeons has has done tremendous work in the field of arthroplasty in enabling uh, research and uh, education of arthroplasty surgeons to do a better job so that eventually our patients uh, stand to benefit from the uh, expertise of our orthopedic surgeons in joint replacement surgery and as we all know joint replacement surgery in india is predicted to increase exponentially over the next few years as more and more patients come in uh, to require joint replacements especially because india is a very young nation as of as of now and most of those who are in the 30s and 40s now are soon going to need a joint replacement done in the next 15 to 20 years or so so i would encourage uh, 
our current members to uh, to encourage their colleagues because we know that a lot of orthopedic surgeons in the peripheries are now beginning to do joint replacements and it would be wonderful if they were to participate with us in improving the membership of the society and contributing to the registry of which Dr. Rajagopal will be speaking to me speaking to us uh, subsequent be, be, uh, subsequent subsequently so uh, as we, uh, 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 the Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons does run a wonderful fellowship program. Now, this is now slightly altered from the uh, previous uh, methodology. It is now predominantly a consultant-driven program. Now, as you're all aware, the Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons has been privileged to have among its members some of the leading arthroplasty surgeons in India who are not just experts, uh, inter inter rec internationally recognized experts in the field of arthroplasty, but also are surgeons who do humongous numbers of joint replacement surgery in their various centers. And it would be their joy and privilege to be in a position to train young budding orthopedic surgeons who wish to uh, uh, concentrate on the in the field of joint arthroplasty. Hence, uh, those of us, uh, the details of this program are on the website and uh, the list of the consultants and their the cities where they work are also there on the website. Those young orthopedic surgeons and our members, of course, uh, who are uh, interested in do, do, doing this fellowship are more than happy, uh, we are more than welcome to com communicate with me or the fellowship chair of the Indian Society of Hippony Surgeons and then through us, uh, get into the uh, get in touch with the con consultants who will take you onto the program based on various criteria which he uh, the candidate may have to fulfill. Uh, the Indian Society of Hippony Surgeons will of course issue a certificate upon the uh, consultant confirming that the candidate has completed the fellowship program to the consultant's satisfaction. Now we have had three fellows who have completed who, who two fellows have completed this new fellowship program with Dr. Avtar Singh over the last one year. And there is one con con continuing his fellowship as of now with him again in Amritsar. Uh, the Indian Society of Hippony Surgeons has, as I said, gone through a very difficult period uh, with a lot of cancellations of, uh, and, uh, and has had to take in a lot of financial stress as well because of the fact that the previous program has been cancelled but we have taken it in our stride and we have continued to persevere with the academic work that we have always been involved in and uh, in fact we have conducted a series of webinars which were well attended and well appreciated all the webinars were conducted under the chairmanship of our president Dr. Hemant Wakankar and were convened and organized by some of the best arthroplasty surgeons around India and, uh, had con and, and, and consisted of uh, faculty from all around the world uh, who are all experts in their fields and uh, uh, these are the list of uh, the uh, webinars which we have conducted over the last what seven of them in fact so uh, it is my privilege and honor to welcome uh, the uh, the members of the uh, new executive board uh, I would like to express our gratitude to all the members who will be exiting the board because of the, of the completion of their uh, tenure. Uh, the new members who, who I have the privilege to welcome include Dr. Dimple Parekh, who will be the new treasurer, uh, the uh, Dr. Nilayan Shah and Dr. Vijay Bose, who will be uh, uh, who, who, who will be the educational chairs, Dr. Manoj Vadava, Dr. Kalpesh Shah, who will be the fellowship chairs, Dr. Narendra Bhai, they will be joining Dr. B.D. Chatterjee as the nominating chair, Dr. Avtar Singh and Dr. Hargun Sangtani will, will be the legal chairs, Dr. Dhanashekar Raja and Dr. A. Prasad will be the membership chairs. Dr. Rajesh Maniar and Dr. Rajesh Malhotra will be the research chairs. Uh, welcome you all to the board. Uh, the Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons has been an enabling body which is a, which has always encouraged research. So I would request all members who are all interested in research and who have a research proposal to, to uh, write to me or to the research chairs and uh, through and through them to, to the, you may communicate with the board of trustees and the executive board and then get their uh, sanction and their permission. In fact, the Indian Society of Hippony Surgeons, if it is happy and uh, satisfied with the scientific uh, uh, scientific content and uh, integrity of the research proposal, uh, will be happy to financially uh, support the research, research uh, projects as well so that we take them on to a, a logical conclusion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Leo. That's wonderful. And you are doing a human service as a secretary. 
with your commitment and dedication now i invite uh, ashok the big brother of me uh, to come and give the secretarial report uh, the registry report sorry registry you all know that uh, ishk has has got a robust registry and probably in another decade it will be the largest registry in the world and uh, thanks to pachure and ashok's uh, human efforts it has really taking shape and ashok is going to talk about that ashok thank you thank you guru good evening uh, friends and uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be a part of this wonderful uh, society and uh, thank you guru for putting together such a wonderful program um so this registry is uh, has come of age um we started in 2007 and it's currently managed by the northgate that manages the uk registry and this is a snapshot of where we are today we started in 2006 and uh, coming all the way to 2021 as uh, has happened in the rest of the world the the pandemic the covid pandemic has uh, spread its ugly uh, head and you can see the drop in numbers in uh, sort of late 19 and 20 and uh, 21 uh, but this is our numbers uh, over the years and uh, we have continued to grow substantially from when we started the number of surgeons uh, we started off in a very modest way and today we have over um, 300 surgeons almost 300 surgeons who are contributing obviously still a drop in the ocean given the large number of uh, surgeons that are available in the country who are performing totally arthroplasties and it's our effort in uh, association with the northgate team uh, to try and encourage all the uh, arthroplasty surgeons to put their uh, content and their cases into the registry and um, make it a very robust uh, 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 registry and as uh, gurva said given the numbers of arthroplasty in this part of the world in this country um we have no doubt that very soon this will be a registry with uh, a lot of muscle a lot of value and will be a referring point just like some of the other well known registries like the swedish registry or the australian registry or the uk registry is so this is our uh, age distribution of the primary totni arthroplasty our bell curve is uh, maximum between the 60 to 69 uh, and if you include the two of them this is almost 45% of the total volume of uh, totally replacements done currently and when you look at the male to female ratio again you you will see that more or less equal um, distribution Uh, there are more female patients of uh, in the relatively younger population and uh, as you get past the 65 to 69 and 70 to 74 uh, the number of uh, male patients uh, increases so the bmi uh, unlike the west where uh, a lot of patients have a very high bmi we still sort of blessed uh, that we are dealing with a average bmi of about 29 for the female patients 27 for the for the male though i might hasten to add this is rapidly increasing exponentially and um, i read recently that india is the fifth most obese country in the world so we are catching up with some of the more uh, obese nations in terms of the gender population as is uh, true of the rest of the world Uh, almost 73% of uh, the knee procedures are female 27 are male uh, predominantly a degenerative osteoarthritis uh, population almost 98% uh, when when i started almost 30 years ago uh, rheumatoids were very very common in fact they formed the bulk of certainly my uh, work as indeed a lot of our senior uh, earlier um, uh, work from um, from our colleagues but more recently with a better medical management of rheumatoid again as has been the practice across the world the number of patients of rheumatoid coming to surgeries have declined and osteoarthritis is the predominant uh, component um this kind of um, illuminates the, the bias in in india in terms of the choice of implant uh, the posterior stabilized the ps version is 82 and it's uh, 
roughly about 14.7, almost 15 percent on the cruciate retaining side. It's heartening for me. I'm a diehard cruciate retainer. And when I started off many years ago, it was point something. So it's a, it's a good uh, spread in terms of uh, the growing popularity of the cruciate retaining implant, though it's still substantially lower uh, compared to some of the Western countries like UK. Um, again, when we look at the tibia, the all poly is 0.23%. Uh, uh, and 2.3% uh, and the metal poly pre-assembled tibial is 0.3%. Uh, <clears throat> Can you just remove this? Ashok? Yeah. Whatever. Sorry, I, I'm trying to get this bar uh, off. I'm not able to do that. It's sort of coming in the way of the... Uh, sir, we are not getting it, sir. We are getting a full screen. Yeah, we are getting you, you're screen. getting a full screen? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I can't actually read the screen. No, That's my... Primary TKR patellar resurfacing. Proposal. Okay, so the, the patellar resurfacing, we have roughly about a 50% uh, uh, bias non-resurfaces are 54% and the petalar resurfaces are 45 Again, this has shown a, a decreasing trend earlier on. A larger percentage of surgeons were replacing the petalar and it, this has come down. Uh, in terms of the manufacturers, uh, DPU has the lion's share in terms of the uh, percentage of uh, implants that are used. Uh, followed by Zimmer, Biomet, Smith & Nephew, and then some of the other uh, manufacturers. Um, in terms of the market penetration, again, you'd see that almost 37% is DePew, 24% uh, uh, Biomet, uh, Zimmer. Uh, Max has, uh, has uh, increased its uh, market presence and has overtaken uh, Smith & Nephew, Stryker, and Exactech, etc., bring up the other uh, implants. In terms of revisions, again, you can see that there has been an exponential rise. Uh, there has been a tailing off over the last uh, two or three years, largely because of the COVID uh, effect. Um, and when you look at the, uh, the indications for revisions, largely aseptic loosening and infection, this is an interesting spread. Uh, I would have thought uh, infection would have been the larger component, but uh, our registry data seems to indicate that infection comes a very close second to aseptic loosening. We are looking at the THR procedures. Again, there has been a rise, and this is a very similar trend to the knee uh, portfolio, a decline in the last uh, two, two and a half years. Uh, again, a male-female ratio, predominantly males as opposed to the knees, which are predominantly females. Uh, the age distribution, again, uh, predominantly between the 50 to 65-year-olds. So we're still dealing with a relatively younger population. Uh, again, in terms of the male to female ratio, you see the, the graph, the bell curve, um, largely females when you look at the uh, 50 to 64 um, and tailing off. In terms of the BMI, again, the, we are dealing with a relatively modest uh, BMI population, not the, uh, the large obese individuals that we seem to see in the West. The primary indications here are uh, largely osteoarthritis. Um, we also have a fairly large component of ankylosing spondylitis, which is 5.6% rheumatoids. Uh, unlike the knees, are uh, a fair, uh, fairly significant number, 6.2%. And then uh, the other indications like fractin femurs, pale hemiarthroplasties, etc. So the implant uh, choices uh, are predominantly cementless. This is almost exclusively a cementless market. There is, interestingly, there is a 2% reverse hybrid uh, population and a very low cemented population. Uh, in terms of the primary THR implant fixation over the last three years, uh, the hybrid and uh, 
the, the rivers hybrid and cemented again form a very very small percentage of the total population which is largely cementless so the cementless procedures has risen exponentially uh, when, from when we started in 2006 uh, today almost comprising uh, 90 percent of the total population in terms of the head size uh, you, you can see over the years uh, the predominant choice seems to be that the relatively larger head the 32 and the 36 and uh, this has been the spread over the last uh, five years uh, proportion of pr uh, procedures using any sort of ceramic has more or less been about 50 percent so the interface is pretty much ceramic on ceramic or ceramic and uh, polyethylene uh, again, in terms of interpretation um, uh, um, of, the, of the implants, in terms of the uh, market share, DPU is by a long way the leader in this part of the world, followed by Zimmer Biomed, Stryker, and Smith & Nephew. Again, the same graph in terms of the femoral components. Uh, in terms of revision procedures, again, the numbers have increased over till 2017-18 and then tailed off. Uh, the largely the indications have been um, aseptic loosening, uh, dislocations, subluxations, and infections. Uh, again, in terms of the uh, distribution between the primary hips and the knees, uh, on the hip side, relatively the smaller uh, population, the, the um, lighter population, and um, the heavier population on the uh, knee side. So that is our snapshot of the um, IJR registry, and uh, we would like to take this. I would like to take this opportunity to encourage all participants and um, invite you to uh, invest in this registry. It's a very robust registry. Uh, we'll be happy to help you in any way we can to help capture your data, and we would encourage all of you to try and contribute to our registry because the registry is going to be the future of arthroplasty in this country. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Gurva. Thank you, Ashok. That was wonderful. We are exactly 30 minutes late and I love to, to keep that as an Indian tradition, Mohit. <laughs> in Canada, but we always love to be India. So 30 minutes, you got to give it to us. So now the second session will be a very interesting session. Research in arthroplasty will be spearheaded by none other than Mohit. And uh, Mohit is a uh, Professor and Academic Head of the Division of Orthopedic Surgery at McMaster University, Ontario. And he is Associate Chair of Research in the Department of Surgery. And recently he is promoted as Professor. And he has done human work in the evidence-based medicine. And he has got a, a Edward Sampson Award, Kappa Delta Award, which is supposed to be one of the largest awards. And he has been acknowledged as the top 10 most cited orthopedic fracture surgeons in the world. And has received Canada's highest honor for his lifetime achievement, the Order of Canada. And currently promoted to the head of the Division of Surgery at McMaster University, Editor-in-Chief of Orthopedic Evidence. And I love his philosophical talks, and I love his uh, philosophical develop your hobby and get out of the orthopedics, live your life for it. I'm a great fan of that. And uh, he is the <laughs> President of Canadian Orthopedic Association, and he has got nine publications in Lancet. Oh, boy. That's great. And the only orthopedic surgeon with this achievement. Mohit, three cheers to you. And he's an excellent painter and writer of par excellence. Mohit, the stage is yours. And you got a new panelist. You got to introduce all of them. And Lalit yeah. Mili and Ram Yakanti, I know the rest of the panel, you introduce. Okay? I will. So I will. Stage is yours. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. And of of course, uh, Dr. Eddie, it's an uh, honor to be here with, uh, with what I hope will be uh, a very interesting and uh, timely session on research. We've just heard lots that's already going on. So what I'll do is before I share my screen, I will just um, remind you that we have two additional panelists, both from Canada at the University of Toronto. Both are surgeon scientists early in their career. So as Ram is speaking from the perspective of a resident in training, we have both doctors, uh, Mundi and Chaudhary from the University of Toronto as surgeon scientists in uh, hip and knee reconstruction, speaking about that first two or three years in practice. Um, as we move forward. And of course, I'm going to be honored uh, to be uh, spe uh, spending some time with them. If I can, I will just go ahead quickly here and begin with just sharing my screen. I presume you can see the screen. Yeah, Mohit, before you go, Lalit Maini is the chief editor of Indian Journal of Orthopedics. Lalit, you are there, right? 
Lalit. Yeah, I'm there. Good, good. Yeah, welcome, good evening, welcome. Good evening, good yeah. evening, Mohit. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Of course, well, then, yeah, it'll a honor to have you with us. So let me just begin with a few slides of introduction here. We have to be thinking much, much bigger uh, as we think about the new frontiers in arthroplasty research. So let me walk you through why it's so profoundly important for us today. If we look at what the world is going through, we look at India in the last few days, we look at what's happening in Canada, we are well into a global third wave in some places even hitting their fourth wave of new peaks. So sometimes when we want to push things forward very quickly, the world tells us to stop and slow down and rethink. What a perfect time for us also to be rethinking about the strategy of how we're going to be doing research broadly in hip and knee reconstruction, but also where we're going to go with this. In my mind, I, I put forth a couple of quick points for us to consider and our panelists to consider. Research that ultimately is gonna to move to big questions. And I believe when we think of reconstruction, we think big questions. There's no reason why we can't answer all the questions that need to be answered with a global collaboration and within India, uh, a national level collaboration. The questions should be significant for everybody. They should be inclusive. They should also have a, a message that not only is important to India, but it's important to the rest of the world because the rest of the world will then hear the message of research. We have to find ways to get more people involved. It was fascinating hearing the report right now of the registry saying that you have already good, meaningful engagement, but the opportunity to grow is much, much greater. And ultimately, if we do our job correctly, friends, we can contribute to the well-being of not just um, our uh, patients that are critically important in our own practices, but to all patients for all surgeons around the world. So how do we start? And today I'm here not to, you know, in 30 minutes, we can't answer all the questions, but we can start having that discussion. We can talk about, well, how much of it is our opinion that matters versus moving up that ladder towards uh, experiments and clinical trials, whether they're large registries or whether they're comparative studies, or maybe we even conduct some analyses like meta-analysis. There's lots of things we can do. I'm reminded of almost 10 years ago today uh, with one of the uh, founding uh, editors of the Indian Journal of Orthopedics, Anil Jain, and I'm uh, someone who, uh, him and I had lots and lots of engagement early on. And I look at this one particular editorial, which was in 2011, where him and I both wrote, evidence-based orthopedics were moving one step closer. And here we are 10 years later, talking about how we can actually really move in that powerful direction. We have a book out coming out very shortly called Evidence-Based Orthopedics. It's a large 187 volume text covering top to bottom orthopedics. But here's the point, friends. We didn't have this capability 10 years ago. We now have it now, which means we have made strides. But how do we continue to find good data for books like this in the future? My belief is we tell stories with randomized trials. I have a, had a career in doing large clinical trials that look anywhere from should we be doing total hip versus hemiarthroplasty in patients with hip fractures all the way through to simple approaches uh, for managing uh, broken bones. Over many years, we've recruited lots of patients. And as uh, Professor Reddy so kindly said, we've had some success but not one of these papers, whether they were in the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet, were done without strong collaboration and multiple sites. In fact, if I look at these studies, there isn't one of these that didn't have colleagues from India involved. You have been a huge important part of some of the, you know, the practice changing studies in the world. But how do we get there? We've got to be thinking big. And big ideas aren't necessarily the complex ones. They're the simple ones. Imagine yourself thinking, what question matters not just to me, but to everybody? And how do we move in that direction? The challenge we have, though, is if you can ask big questions, you have to be ready to take some risk and fail. Science is failure, we have to, but we have to keep pushing forward. You know, the greatest of all uh, Nobel Prize laureates have lived many, many, many failures before a fundamental success. These are the things that we'll talk about in our discussion. You know, how do we actually uh, get things simpler? How do we get the right teams of people involved? How do we actually have the right infrastructure to move things forward? And how do we learn, not from just our own mistakes, the wise of us will learn from the mistakes of others and use that information so we can grow quickly. 
So my analogy today is start. We have to seek mentorship and the, you know, the Indian society here has the opportunity to mentor many, many trainees. We've got to get the right training. We've got to find the right collaborations internally. And most importantly, we have to decide on the right question. If we get the right question, then yes, we can with the tenacity and the courage to say we will push forward and get it done. These things will happen. And I'll leave you with one final thought before we move to our first speaker, which is ultimately you have, this organization has a real opportunity to develop talent. And, you, and I would take that as seriously as you possibly can because your investment in developing the talent and the infrastructure to do these studies, I think will pay you dividends. The same way when we started 10 years ago talking about evidence-based medicine in the Indian Journal of Orthopedics, the dividends it's paid, I think have been immeasurable. So I'll stop there, and I would like very much if I could to ask Ram if he wouldn't mind uh, just sharing his slides in a short presentation here before asking Dr. Chaudhry to do another uh, short presentation before we go to the open panel. All right, can everyone hear me and see my slides? We can. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Bandari. Um, my name is Ram Yakanti. I'm a fourth year resident in orthopedic surgery at the University of Miami. I want to thank the Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons, uh, the organizing team, as well as Dr. Gurardi for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So my talk is about research in arthroplasty, a resident's perspective. But this talk is a lot more uh, general and can be applied to orthopedic residents and training in general. And it close a lot of the um, things Dr. Bandari was mentioning about training the next generation of surgeons. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So th my, the basic outline for, for my talk, I'm going to talk uh, first about um, arthroplasty training in North America, uh, the structure of it for maybe members of the audience that aren't as familiar, what research opportunities are available for us in training here, why research is important in training and to the trainee, as well as a plan of action for trainees and faculty who are interested in uh, making research a bigger part of their career. So this is the basic outline for um, arthroplasty training in North America, broken down by years. I have the, um, the Indian system here from what I understand to be um, uh, you know, commonly used uh, for comparison. But the way the American system works is we have a um, fiber orthopedic surgery residency that is uh, done through a organized match that medical students will uh, opt to go into. It's a very competitive process. And then similarly, um, over 95% of all orthopedic surgery residents now are, are choosing to do a subspecialty fellowship. And in, in our case, we're talking about arthroplasty. But uh, the important point to stress here is that research exposure happens very, very early on in our academic careers. Um, students all the way uh, from undergraduate college are actually exposed to research and research opportunities as it is a, usually a big part of uh, applications. So if you wanna be a competitive applicant to get into medical school or get into orthopedic surgery residency, uh, distinguishing yourself by doing research um, has a huge impact. So in terms of the actual requirements in residency, the ACGME, which is the accreditation body that oversees all resident activity as well as fellowships, actually requires that residencies have research as an integral part of uh, residency training. And these are some of their core competencies that they expect um, each resident residency program to provide for residents, including a 60 days of protected research time for us to learn about research and learn how to um, do experimental design and uh, further. Um, what research opportunities do we have that we usually take part of? Most residents and fellows, I would say, work with home institution mentors. I've had the opportunity and uh, pleasure of working with Dr. Robinson and Dr. Hernandez, who are my mentors at my home institution who have been phenomenal in kind of fostering my interest in research and taking me down this path. Um, beyond uh, home institution mentors, there are many students now in America doing a dedicated research year in between medical school and residency. So they'll take an extra year, go to a foreign institution or a, another institution in a different state and do an entire year of dedicated research uh, in order to improve their applications, learn about the process. Uh, and similarly, the ACGME requires that residencies have research um, inv involvement. However, they do not define how much of it. So there's many programs that offer re research tracks ranging from a few months as well as all the way to a year or two where there are a few residencies in orthopedics that are six or seven years long because they have dedicated a year or, or two for research specifically. 
In terms of funding available, there are many national organizations that offer uh, funding for orthopedic surgery residents. The OREF is a big organization, Orthopedic Residency, or Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation, which has over $100,000 available for resident-specific research only. Beyond that, the AAOS and AUKUS, which is the American Hip and Knee Society, also has some funding available for residents. Um, there are also small funding opportunities and grants available through the individual departments and universities where we train. So looking through the literature about this topic, uh, I've been able to um, curate a few important studies. Um, many of these were published in very high impact journals such as JBJS and CORE. And an overwhelming majority of them support the fact that resident scholarly activity in training is very, very beneficial. Over the next uh, few slides, I'll try to summarize the salient points of these studies. So what is the importance of research to the trainee, the resident or the fellow? I think most importantly, it teaches them critical thinking skills. It allows them to apply the scientific method in a real world scenario. It allows them, it teaches them the ability to critically evaluate new literature, which is extremely important for anyone who is uh, in our field of medicine, even if you're not going to be an active researcher. It makes, on a more practical note, it makes them more competitive for applications for fellowship or future faculty appointments. It also provides a personal sense of accomplishment uh, of achieving something beyond clinical medicine. Um, on a more macroscopic level, the benefits to the trainee are that uh, the trainees that go through a research um, experience and um, process uh, are more likely to question non-evidence-based ideas and dogmas that have traditionally been accepted in orthopedics. They seek new knowledge by experimentation. They promote innovative thinking and happen to tend to become lifelong learners, which is vital for our, our career. So how is resident research important to the orthopedic community or the joint replacement community as a whole? Uh, obviously, these future residents are going to be, uh, these residents are going to be future orthopedic surgeons, and it's vital that they have the uh, building blocks to be able to properly evaluate um, basic science and clinical developments and be part of those developments. Not only are the future surgeons going to uh, need to have a solid basic science background and clinical study background, but also be able to analyze quality of their work, the costs associated, as well as work with the healthcare systems, which is becoming uh, increasingly important in North America. So uh, they also, good, good researchers also tend to evaluate outcomes to ensure safety and efficacy for treatment for all of our patients um, that are involved in musculoskeletal care. Um, research tends to create new leaders that bring about big changes from the bench to the bedside and also leads to innovation in the field of orthopedics in general. So this is my advice to any trainees listening today. So residents in general orthopedics or people um, interested in arthroplasty fellowship, the most important and valuable piece of advice I can give you is finding a good mentor. Um, many of the studies that I've highlighted before uh, mentioned that having strong mentorship, mentors that are invested in education, research, and have a fund of experience are uh, vital in making a residence research ex experience successful. Beyond that, on a personal level, seeking out opportunities whenever they're available, getting involved with uh, whatever small project that you can in the starting so that you can learn the process of scientific discovery, such as case reports, small database studies, institutional retrospective reviews, or systematic reviews, which are not necessarily um, uh, intensive in terms of the amount of funding you need or resources. And then um, moving on to larger studies, such as large database studies or prospective studies that Dr. Bandario was talking about that really try to answer the big questions in orthopedics. Um, I think a kind of a technical tidbit is having a knowledge of statistics as a trainee is, goes a long way in making you very, very important in any uh, research project. Being able to use um, statistical analysis software like SPSS or Excel um, and having a good fund of statistical knowledge actually makes you invaluable to any research team, especially ones where there's little funding and little resources. Uh, this is a quote I've uh, heard Dr. Bandari say in one of his talks other, before, which is, look locally but think globally. I think this is a fantastic mindset to have as a, um, uh, a trainee seeking out for more opportunities. There might not necessarily be opportunities in your own institution, but there might be one just down the street or in another state. Or with the globalized world now and the virtual world that we have, it is easier than ever to collaborate uh, virtually even across continents. So even uh, opportunities in a different country might not be out of the question. I personally have been able to make use of this opportunity during COVID and have been lucky enough to have 
uh, been part of research in between India and uh, America, between our two institutions in Miami and Sunshine Hospitals with Dr. Gorardi. It's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my residency training so far. And finally, don't fear failing. If you don't ask, if you don't seek for opportunities, uh, you're never going to even get started. And finally, uh, um, a plan of action for programs and faculty members in the audience that are looking to build a more robust research um, experience for their trainees is number one is invest in mentorship. Similarly, having faculty that are in interested in teaching and furthering the careers of their uh, residents uh, goes a long way in making the research output of a department better. Creating small opportunities for trainees such as funding through small grants or making resources available and having data available such as uh, access to databases um, um, is, is huge in having um, residents be more productive. Promoting a culture of scholarship and innovative thinking, thinking, I think, is very important. And most importantly, giving room for the trainees to be inquisitive and question, is, be that in the operating room or uh, in journal clubs, whenever there's an opportunity to have a discussion with residents, allowing them to ask questions and be inquisitive is, I think, one of the most important things that spurs our um, um, ability to think outside the box and make something productive in research. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ron. Very, very, very helpful. As we move forward to the last presentation, um, I invite Dr. Mundi just to put his slides up, but he will share the podium, so to speak, uh, with Dr. Chowdhury as they speak a little bit about what the next direction should be. How do we move forward with research uh, in arthroplasty broadly? Uh, you guys can hear me? All right. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning from uh, Toronto. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to, to join um, uh, this group here today. And um, uh, I, I think we're going to keep this quite brief. Um, from my understanding is that uh, we want to have a bit of a, a discussion, um, a bit of a QA. and a um, So we'll, we'll keep this brief. But really, you know, when uh, Dr. Bhandari sort of asked us to, to give a quick uh, talk, um, you said that the discussion would be sort of what are going to be the new uh, frontiers in, in arthroplasty um, uh, research. Um, and so, you know, if you think about clinical practice over the past 10, 20, 30 years, it's evolved. And, uh, you know, in, in a similar sort of fashion, research methods and the study designs um, and the way in which we conduct studies have also changed in the past 20 years. And um, that would suggest that sort of as we move forward, perhaps um, there's going to be a, continue to be an evolution um, in the way we think about trials and, and, and how they inform practice. Um, so uh, really what we're going to break down is sort of the, the top five study designs that uh, we believe uh, will um, inform practice um, over the next uh, 10 years or so. And uh, I'm going to, just because we want to keep it brief, I'm going to sort of uh, turn it over to, to Dr. Chaudhry, who's uh, also a colleague from uh, Toronto, and he'll talk about the first few, uh, and then I'll sort of take it from there. Great. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, in, in terms of the, the highest impact research we've seen in the modern research era, uh, and I'm not talking about the case series that have come for the decades and We lose them. Maybe that's my cue to continue then. <laughs> yeah. All right, so so maybe I'll I'll just uh, to carry on until uh, we get the Dr. Uh, Chaudhry back here. Um, so once again, this is sort of our uh, subjective list, but um, number five on that list is would be systematic uh, reviews. Um, it's, um, you know, this is a, a study that was done recently, and um, if you look to the right here, it uh, demonstrates that, um, you know, over the past uh, decade, that the number of systematic reviews that are being published in the literature um, have started, have rised uh, considerably, and in fact, the quality of the, the systematic reviews have improved over time. And if you look at the, the hierarchy of evidence, um, when systematic reviews and meta-analyses are used appropriately 
in which they're summarizing the results of randomized control trials, they can in fact be um, quite powerful uh, research methods. And so I think we're going to continue to see a proliferation of systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and the next sort of evolution of meta-analyses, which would are now being um, uh, network meta-analyses. And in the right circumstances, I think this can, these can be informative to practice. Great. Sorry, I just, uh, I don't know, I got kicked off, but that's, that's all right. I, 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 I took over for number five, so you can maybe take, uh, resume here, Harmon. Great. Yeah. So I think large cohort studies are, are your next kind of, uh, you know, frontier in research. Uh, and this is kind of, it gives you a level of granularity that you simply can't get from registry-based data. And that's looking at research prospectively. So, you know, things like harms and exposures where you can't do randomized trials or things like prognostic information. If we're trying to gather information about na natural history of a disease, what happens to a, prosthet a prosthetic joint infection five, 10 years out? Um, and looking at all the different uh, uh, patient outcomes and the details and things that, you know, many of my colleagues that work in databases say are simply not achievable through registries and databases. Um, I think that is another frontier that we're looking at uh, moving forward. And this is, I just put down the, uh, one of the sub-studies of the enormous uh, trial that uh, Dr. Bhandari led along with uh, many of the centers in India. And this is something that hasn't been done in arthroplasty. Uh, you know, multi-centered, multinational work, uh, looking at prognostic information and, uh, and the gaps in care. So that's another frontier in, in, in research. Research. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's this uh, um, this sort of uh, uh, idea of real world data, and um, often it's synonymous with um, data that is collected through through registries. And I think arthroplasty in particular is well positioned um, to be informed by real world data. I think in the, the talk prior there was a discussion, obviously, about sort of the the growth of the the Indian registry. Um, but also um, existing registries, such as the Swedish registry or the Australian registry. Um, and uh, it's not just registries, but I think we've, uh, through sort of technological advancements, we have an increasing number of uh, data repositories to which we have access. Um, here in North America, it's, you see a lot of studies based, uh, published based on insurance databases, uh, quality, um, surgical quality improvement programs, so on and so forth. And... Um, I think what we've seen a lot in the literature, of course, is trends of sort of what kind of implants are being used, so on and so forth. Um, but what I think has started to recently dominate is advanced statistical approaches to actually have cause and effect um, or develop associations and help us make predictions about which patients are going to do well or which treatments are options. So you'll, you'll hear things now in the literature quite commonly about things like propensity score analysis or propensity score matching, where the buzzword now is machine learning. Um, and uh, if, if you look at, uh, this is just sort of a, a bit of a, a snapshot of uh, looking at uh, PubMed. So if you just type in propensity analysis, um, you can see this exponential rise in the number of hits you get. Um, around propensity analysis. And of course, if you sort of put in propensity analysis arthroplasty, it follows a similar rise. So I think we're going to continue to see an increasing number of publications that are based on real world data and that are based on sort of some of these, these new techniques that have become almost buzzwords. Um, and once again, machine learning and arthroplasty, same thing. You know, 10 years ago, we saw virtually no publications. Um, but now that we have access to these databases, um, you're seeing sort of new techniques and new statistical approaches. Uh, and I think sort of especially in India, as this, you know, as mentioned that there's the, uh, the growth and success of this database, this certainly is um, an opportunity to, to publish very informative uh, research. Um, this, I think what we're also going to see um, more commonly is what we call pragmatic and registry-based RCTs. And um, I'm sure everyone's sort of seen this sort of uh, hierarchy of evidence where randomized controlled trials um, sit sort of at the, the top of the hierarchy and then the observational studies, which sort of typically includes registry-based data, um, sit somewhere in the middle. But I would argue that sometimes these uh, hierarchies aren't mutually exclusive. Um, so in a traditional randomized controlled trial, um, you randomize the patients and then each individual center has research coordinators and staff to follow up with patients. Um, but what uh, there's been sort of a, um, a, a recognition that our databases have become better. So perhaps 
in a new method, we can randomize patients, but rather than using the resources to follow them individually, we can assess their outcomes using registries and databases. Um, and especially in orthopedics, where a lot of the interventions are standard of care interventions, whether we're looking at certain dressings, um, irrigation solutions, um, I think we're well positioned um, to, to, to use and utilize this type of approach to conducting clinical trials. And of course, I think uh, number one, which will sort of always move the needle the most, is the large multi-center uh, randomized control trials. And if, if we're looking at uh, new interventions, um, ones that aren't standard of care, um, as um, you know, been mentioned several times previously, is that the, the most informative trials and, and the most you know difficult ones to execute are the land, large randomized control trials. And uh, here's just sort of a, a quick uh, uh, overview of a publication that uh, came out recently, once again by uh, uh, the group at um, uh, McMaster. Um, and where they looked at the number of randomized control trials published in, in the journal of bone and joint surgery and from uh, you know, about uh, 1988 to 2000 and then more recently. And as you can see that the number of publications has nearly doubled in terms of randomized control trials and also the quality of randomized control trials have improved. And uh, therefore, uh, I think we're going to see more randomized control trials. Um, and I think that because they sort of have better methodology, they should be able to inform practice. So we're, I think we're going to leave it there and then uh, turn it back over to, to Dr. Bandari so we can do a bit of a Q&A. Sure. So we have about four minutes left and uh, I want to be cognizant of time. Uh, oh, we have a bit of time. Okay. So uh, let me just... Yeah. Another 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Can, perfect. Can perfect. Totally take, Thank you. Total 15, 20 minutes. No issues. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so let me, if I could, just ask everyone to come back on video, those who are the panelists. I see everyone here. Um, let me, um, if I could, ask... Uh, you know, our esteemed editor of the uh, you know, Indian Journal of Orthopedics, if you have any initial comments from hearing um, some of these um, discussions and, you know, as it relates to publication in the journal, and then I think we can open it up thereafter to a few other questions. Thanks, Mohit, uh, for that excellent introduction to this important topic. And uh, my comment would be that uh, over the years, we have seen a sea of change in research from India whether it be in orthoplasty or otherwise. And we've, we're getting into the structure. And uh, as uh, you shared few publications which uh, demonstrate the increase in randomized controlled trials uh, in orthoplasty over the globe, and uh, we see it uh, happening uh, even in India. And uh, the other thing which you uh, brought out was uh, uh, think globally. I think that's uh, very, very relevant, but then uh, we need to sort of even connect locally. So uh, our uh, research will always be need-based, but then there would be certain research which would be something like, say, the implant surfaces. They are going to be global research. But uh, if there's going to be something related to ethnics or, eth or the religion or the culture of a particular region, uh, the local questions do uh, remain relevant. And also there is a change uh, in the training part in the residency uh, in India regarding uh, uh, inculcating uh, uh, practice of, uh, you know, scientific research and even training them. In fact, uh, National Medical Council has come up with an online program which is uh, assignment based. It has 60 modules and it needs to be done uh, over three months and it has an assessment at the end of it and it gets a certification and it's a pretty robust uh, sort of uh, 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 research course which is uh, to be done across all specialties. So it has created a very strong base and also the, the curriculum have brought in uh, quite a few things which are getting the residents into research. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just jump back then to you, Ram, um, while we have from maybe if there's anyone in the audience who wants to ask, ask a question, please do. But when you think about um, resident training, what um, are the typical types of studies that you've been doing or what makes sense? Because it wouldn't make a lot of sense for residents to embark on a large randomized trial, probably. Yeah. Um it's funny you asked that. So I learned that the hard way. That's what I tried to do starting second year, and uh, it's, it's still ongoing. So uh, the, the, 
I think the type of studies that are good to start with, especially with someone who doesn't have much research experience, is maybe case series, case reports. I've done a few of those that are um, easy, to, easy to do. It just gets you used to the basic scientific process. How do you put together a manuscript? How do you submit it to a journal? How do you collect data and present it properly? Beyond that, the, the, the type of studies that are a little bit easier to do are probably re local database studies. So we have a few databases that our joint surgeons maintain here that we've been able to ask, uh, access, and th those are maintained prospectively and IRB approved. So we usually mine those databases and uh, try to answer important research questions that we come up with. Um, beyond that, I think trying to go through and do a, a randomized control trial or a large database study right off the bat could be discouraging to some residents. So just because it, it takes a long time, it's years and years, um, and it's a huge amount of resources that are necessary. So I, I would advise to start with something that's a little bit more feasible. Um, and that's, that's what's been successful for me. Let me just, if I could, thank you, Ram. Let me ask uh, Drs. Mundi and Chowdhury the same, the same issue, the same question. You know, when you think about in your first your few years, First few, first few years, what are you thinking about in terms of the types of studies that are feasible for you? And then I'm going to ask you all a broader question, which is how can we identify research that could uh, directly be collaborative um, with this society? Uh, do you want to start, Armin? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, so, you know, as we're going through this, uh, you know, I think, you know, all re good research, I just want to make sure you can hear me, right? My we can hear you. Been, uh, yeah. On and off. I, I think, uh, Raman, why don't you start? Nope. I think he's frozen. Yeah, oh, sure, sure. So, um, Maybe okay, uh, uh, I think all good research, I think, goes right back to it starts locally. Um, yeah, sure. Am, am I taking over here? Yeah, I think you should go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, so, so the question is, you know, what, what are the types of things that you're thinking about as an early career researcher? Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, uh, mentorship and, and collaboration. Um, sort of that, that's got to be on the, the forefront. Um, you can't do research, especially meaningful research, um, in isolation. Um, it takes infrastructure, um, it takes, uh, you know, exchange of ideas. Um, so, so that's the first thing. And then the, the second thing, um, I, I think it's important to, to, to do your due diligence and develop a bit of a storyline. You know, I, I think that the idea of jumping into a randomized control trial, um, based on just a, a clinical hunch, um, it, it, there's, there's a lot of that should precede that. Um, I, I think it's hard to go to a granting agency and say, I've got an idea, can you give me some funding? I think all those smaller studies we talked about, whether it's systematic reviews, patient surveys, physician surveys, they can really be helpful in your early career to say what you think or your clinical observation to substantiate it, to say, hey, there's a lack of evidence. Hey, there's discrepancy among surgeons. Um, this is an important issue to patients. Um, and at the same time, it does help to, I think, the, although the volume of publications you have early in your career aren't the end goal, but it does help you to feel to have some of those rewards as you're building up to the big RCT. Um, and so I think it's important to maybe, in a, in a sense, slow down and, and develop your storyline and, um, and do that in collaboration with others. And then at, this, at the, the end goal should be to work towards sort of a meaningful clinical study. And I would just add that, um, you know, all good ideas start on the ground and uh, talking to your colleagues, talking to your, uh, you know, people on the ground, the people who are not necessarily even interested in research, like there's so much rich information there, uh, you know, even within the society, but even, you know, to your residents, medical students, I think just keeping an open mind and trying to get as many ideas as you can and then seeing what people are excited about, seeing what you're excited about and letting that grow organically a little bit. Um, and, uh, and from there, that can kind of blossom into something that's multi-center, then multinational, and then global. Um, so, you know, all good ideas exist. They're on the ground. We just have to find them and kind of, uh, f you know, water them and allow them to flourish. 
Often, I think, you know, the question is, when I, when I look on the outside in, right, so we've done, you know, the multinational trials in trauma, and I think our last trial just finished recruiting its 39,000th patient for the study. We're close to 40,000 in. You know, I, I've always been a little perplexed why we haven't resolved the issue of um, implant infection or, you know, a prosthetic joint infection and arthroplasty. And the question, and the, it's always raised is, from my colleagues, is, well, it's only 2% and to get it down to 1% or, you know, depending on the groups, uh, it's going to require thousands and thousands of patients. And my question is, so why don't we do it? It's not that complicated, right? I mean, we, this is a very common, common uh, procedure. Um, and it has been, I think, really ripe for a multinational uh, study, which easily is going to be in the scope of 30 to 40,000 patients randomized. India will be absolutely critical in that study. Um, and I will let you know as colleagues and friends that uh, we are starting a pilot now of 1,000 patients, um, which we will then roll into 20,000 patients. Uh, we've been funded for just under a million dollars to do that, and we'll be looking to raise the additional five or seven million dollars. We will be coming to India, and we're already working very closely with centers in India. I would love it, just on a broad note, to be able to engage this particular group of esteemed um, surgeons to participate or help us think through how we can do it. It needs to be a frugal design, and it needs to be very simple in terms of the data we collect. I believe we can pull this off, um, and I'm very, very excited with the opportunity to be here today anyway, to share with you a little bit about research uh, and with our panelists as well, thanking all of them for their uh, time and their insights uh, today. I think we will uh, close this session and uh, thanking you again, Dr. Reddy, for uh, the opportunity to share some of our um, discussion with the rest of the audience. Mohit, as uh, well, and thanks to your two young colleagues from Canada and Ram from Miami. It has really opened a lot of insights. And Mohit, let me tell you officially, by tomorrow, this time, I'll be the president of Indian Society of Equipment Researchers. Today, I'm president-elect. Tomorrow, I'm taking the reins from him. <laughs> let me tell you, you will be spending more time in the coming year under my presidentship with the Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons. Uh, I've been honored. Definitely, we will we will be inspired by you and we will definitely do a lot of things. And as you rightly said, India has got a lot of volumes and you can see that our mix of young and seasoned uh, uh, campaigners in orthoplasty and we will do definitely much more work in this field of research. That's why I gave this uh, precious 30 minutes to you and you have done justice to that, Mohit, and we will be doing more and more in the future. Thank you so wonderful. much to all the panelists. It was wonderful to have you here. Don't go away. Much more to come for all the youngsters. So stay back and enjoy the session. Mohit, Thank you. you should give us a philosophical talk. Okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Now, Thank you. welcome to the next session. And uh, the next session will be moderated by my rock star friend from Delhi, who will be one day Chief Minister of Delhi, I'm sure, Manoj Vadwa. And... Uh, he is the director and chairman of the Elite <coughs> Joint Replacement Center. And uh, the keynote speaker will be Victor Hernandez. And Victor is a good friend. And he's an adult reconstructive surgeon and associate professor in the Department of Orthopedics in the University of Miami. His research focuses on outcomes, disparities, and cost effectiveness analysis of joint reconstruction. I think, Victor, it will be more useful for us as well. His research has been showcased in regional, national, and international uh, meetings over 100 occasions. And currently, he is in University of Miami, and he's also vice chair of the international uh, group of uh, AUKUS. So, over to you, Manoj. You are the boss for the next 30 to 40 minutes. Thanks, Prova. Thanks, team for this session. In the next couple of minutes, we are going to be speaking on uh, Intraoperative complications in total knee replacement, how to get out of the trouble. We have a wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Victor Hernandez from University of Miami. I also have with us a very expert panelist from India, Dr. my friend Dr. Avatar Singh from Amritsar, Dr. Nilain Shah from Mumbai, Dr. Narayan Hulse from Bangalore and Dr. Nindradi from Hyderabad. So I think the way we'll devise this is 
first we'll have our keynote speaker presenting on uh, his experience on intraop complications and then i will take a couple of cases running sound to the panelists and we'll share our experiences so may i now invite dr victor hernandez to load up his uh, talk and put up on the share screen okay everybody can hear me okay and uh, see my presentation yeah Thank you, thank you, Dr. Guraf. Thank you, Manut, for uh, inviting me. I have the opportunity to learn because I have learned more than I can probably teach today. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about interoperative complications. I only have eight minutes, so I'm going to try to make it very quick. This is my conflict of interest. Interoperative complications are a major disaster for us, and one of the problems is we don't pay attention during surgery. We're going to pay later because they will show up later on recovery and then we have to take the patient back to fix it. So it's, uh, uh, attention to the details is where the devil is. So pay attention during surgery. So first, I'm gonna talk about patellar injury. Occurs in between 0.17% to 2.5%. And most of these injuries are resolved from abortion from the tibial tubercle or insertion or direct injury while we do the surgery. Patients that are at risk normally are patients that has severe stiffness of the knees as well as patella baja. And the treatment normally occurs when we are trying to take the fat pad from the patellar tendon and we uh, intentionally cut the patella. Normally when this happens, I use the, pretty much the same techniques that we use for patella repair. I drilled a couple of holes, put two anchors, and then using a crack uh, technique, I can go over the patella. When patients have poor tissue quality, we can use augmentations like the hamstring and sometimes in revisions or primaries that has the attached completely the patellar tendon, we can use the mesh technique from the Mayo Clinic. When, when we have this major, normally I repair like I've, I was doing an osteotomy. And if we have a major defect, I use the mesh technique that has been previously described. Well, you use a vest over the pan technique, take a mesh going all the way up and allows arthrofibrotic tissue well, to grow between the soft tissue and the mesh. And normally after surgery, I place this patient on a cast for six weeks and then I transfer into a hinge brace and allow them to start motion. This technique is very important for people who lost revisions and, and to always have uh, in mind because it has good outcomes uh, reported by Dr. Hansen and Dr. Abdel at the Mayo Clinic. How to prevent this? Uh, most of the time, patients that has previous uh, knee scopes it's important for us to try to detach the fat pad from the patellar tendon and then protect that patellar tendon using a corker, allow that corker to go uh, towards the outside and use always pay attention to use the blade on a way that the, 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 the sharp part is away from the tendon. Pay attention to those detail, always the, ten, the scalpel away from the tendon. Uh, because this is a, a major out, uh, change outcome for the patient. And this is a paper for, from Dr. Salem. Uh, he demonstrated that in old scores, woman score, SF36, and knee society scores, patient underwent on the, on the final score at six months post-op, and most of them reach almost 10 points of difference. This is another paper from Dr. Brian and James Rand, who uh, published 18 patellar tendon ruptures in TKA, and only four of them were successful after repair. Four of them ended up with deep infection and most of them ended up with a lack of um, uh, extension. So I'm going to now to the MCL. The MCL is another pillar that if we have a damage occurs in between 0.7 to 8%, and most of the injuries uh, are resolved from chronic injuries and iatrogenic injuries, direct damage to the mid substance. The patients that are at risk Morbidly obese with virus, pay attention to this patient. Sometimes we have grade one, grade two during surgery, but when we cut through uh, saw blades, we can have grade three. And the loss of the MCL is important because it's one of the major uh, stabilizers from the knee and is the most common cause of short-term failure and return to the OR in early recovery. So normally when you have mid-substance uh, abulsion or, or rupture, you can primary report or you can use augment. There's three different ways you can do damage to the MCL. The mid-system is the most common, but you can also have abulsion. When you say the mid-system, I normally use this technique, the brain uh, suture, 
I put the knee in mid flexion and I repaired until uh, I restored the stability of the knee. If it's an abortion, I use anchors and then I put my patients in knee brace for six weeks and allow full revert. There's different reports, normally, and this report from uh, Dr. Rosenberg, uh, without using um, their knee brace after surgery and allows the patient full repairing, they actually see uh, some decrease in the rate of motion of the patient. So normally, in this population, uh, reach 120 degrees, they report 108 degrees, as well and deferral, uh, deferral uh, uh, reports. Augmentation, you can use the semitendinosus or the qualis tendon to do free grafting. And also, these reports are a little better than the ones that you only report. You can also change the liner uh, when you have an MCL. But I want to call to the attention that conversion to a PS from a CR does not provide any restraint in virus or virus. So if you're going to change, you have to change for a constrained liner. Normally, the constrained liner is going to have a post that is higher and wider. And that normally, it depends on the company, but it can go from two to plus three um, constraining virus virus. Uh, there's a paper, important paper for Lockheed, who demonstrate that all the failures on this report were patients that were converted into the PS in a state of converting into constraint. How to prevent? I use these retractors normally to prevent adding the uh, MCL or the LCL. When you use laminar spreader or spacers, you have to be careful not to put too much pressure. And now we're going into intraoperative fractures. This occurs up to 2.2%, more common on females, on the femoral condyle, on osteoporotic patients, AVN, rheumatoid arthritis, and stiff knees. This is a report, very important. Most of them were occurs uh, during exposure, trialing, and cementing, as well as on the medial femoral condyle. You can use uh, it's also report on use of PS, constraint liner, or pins from robotics or navigation. This is a paper from Lombardi who shows and demonstrate how when you make the cut for the box, you can make it too tight. And then when you put the uh, uh, femoral condyle, you can put pressure and uh, produce a condylar fracture. As well as when you have angular insertion of the femoral component. If you have a non-displaced intercondylar, no change if you have a displace that goes to the cortices. Normally, I use partially thread cancellous. When you have femoral fracture and you have a displace unstable intercondylar, I use plates and I increase to a stem. And when you have highly communal fracture, you use distal femoral replacement or tibial fractures, pretty much the same concept. If you have vertical cracks that are on displaced, you can use compression screws. And when it's un unstable, I change for the stem tibia. And if it goes metaphyseal, I goes into the plate. This report normally has high rate of radiographic healing in several reports with good outcomes. This is the, uh, something to keep in mind now that we're doing more cementless knees. This can happen during some, as uh, uh, putting the final components because they're press fit. When this happened, normally I change into a stem and I put two cancellous screws and I, I, I turn the TVL component or the fracture component into a cement component. And finally, for vascular injury, occurs in between uh, 0 to 0 0.23. This is one of the most uh, dramatic damage that you can do on a knee because increase the mortality rate at 7% and amputation to 42%. Uh, the popliteal is the most common one with blunt trauma and it's increased risk from patients that have soft tissue contracture and post-traumatic fibrosis. The time when you're doing the tibial cut, the posterior cut, and applications of the retractor on the posterior for this location, you have to be very careful with patient that has previous fibrosis on the back. When you do this maneuver, you have to be very careful. Always remind yourself that the popliteal artery is 0.6 millimeters on extension, and it can go to 1.7 millimeters on flexion. So I always do my cut on flexion. Some people like to do mini binding bases and doing some of the cutting extension. But if you do that, remind yourself that it's more close than you expected. So when that happens, just call the vascular surgeon, ask anesthesia to give heparin immediately, put your finger and start praying that you have a vascular surgeon close to you because you're going to need it. For take-home message, intraoperative complications occurs to all of us. It has happened to me. And the guy who doesn't have an intraoperative complication is probably because he's not doing too much surgeries. Uh, but you have to be always prepared with preoperative planning, intraoperative planning, 
and assessment of before closing the knee, uh, post-operative assessment. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for a wonderful run through. So, what we're going to do next in the next, say, 20, 25 minutes is I'm going to present certain case presentations. And uh, we will have input from you as well as our expert panelists on how you would address those situations. So, if you know that while doing total knee replacement, it is likely that a surgeon might encounter dilemma, obstacles, potential crisis, certain things expected and certain things unexpected on the table. Because it is very different for us in India because normally for majority of our centers, we are not as well equipped as a backup. So we need to anticipate the problems. We need to have the way in and way out for those problems. So what are the bailout out options for these problems? So now the problems can occur during exposure, trialing or implantation. What I want to run through now is certain case presentations. These are my disclosures. I do research concerning speaking first person after you and Meryl. The first caveat I would like to remember is see the complication before it sees you. Now, let me start up with uh, Dr. Hulse, Dr. Nain. So, if you are going in a situation and you realize that you have done a femoral cortical perforation, either just in the entry or say mid area at the isthmus, what would you do at that stage? Okay, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. So you have this situation. So a, yeah. So I can see there's an anterior perforation of the digital femur. And uh, you have a small perforation which is like uh, about 10% of the cortical diameter of the digital femur. I would suggest that you know this is not a major issue. You can fill that area with a graft. And most likely, you can use a normal component. In case it is a very osteoporotic bone, and also if your anterior cut has gone through that uh, hole again, making the hole bigger, you may end up putting a small stem for this uh, femoral component. I think, well, for summarize, for the majority of these uh, perforations in the anterior cortex, you can go with it. They happen in the beginning or they happen at the mid shaft level. If it is in the initial area under the cut, these are the kind of perforations. You can plug them with a bone graft and proceed on with a normal implant. Well summarized, Nguyen. Yeah. So now this goes to my dear friend uh, Nilin. You are a CR user like me, right? So Nilin, yes. you are there. So you are trialing your component, you are doing perfectly well, it was a bit tight in inflection, you went across and you have an avulsion of your PCL from the tibial base. Now what is the carry home message? Would you convert to a PAS or how would you handle this kind of a situation? Uh, Manoj, this happens fairly frequently I would say and uh, I would not even consider a complication because most of the knee implants that you have, they have curved inserts as well. So a deep dish or something would be available and then you can put that in and it will be pretty okay. The other thing that I feel is that if on trialing it has happened, that means that the knee was a little tight in flexion and this has actually balanced your knee quite well. Yeah, but so I would not worry too much unless, unless there is a definite, uh, you, you see a posterior sag inflection if you see a posterior sag inflection and the deep dish is not there i would convert to a ps good let me summarize i think wonderfully uh, said Nilin. majority of these things are around if you have balanced your knee well in flexion as well as extension move on with a normal insert if at all you still want to be safe move and deep dish on ultra concrete insert very very rarely as you say you have a sag or so you will have to convert this to a ps Majority of these needs do not require any special intervention. Now, uh, Dr. Narendra Reddy, you are doing your tibial section or the femoral section, accidentally you cut across your popliteus tendon, either at the base on the lateral femoral condyle or mid substance. What would you do at that stage? What is the carry home as Yeah, this is the most common thing to happen when you do a surgery. Uh, you tend to cut the popliteus. I don't think uh, uh, there is much to needed to do with this unless you feel it is opening on the lateral side. 
otherwise i think uh, a cut on a probability is uh, um, if you can uh, put a stitch and repair it leave it otherwise if you are not able to do that i think uh, it doesn't make any big difference uh, nothing much is needed to do once you find that probability is cut that's my personal uh, the karyo crux message is that uh, as narendra also says that uh, unlike a native knee where cutting probability is would give you a lot of amortable instability majority of these cases it's best you can suture them if and if not it is uh, not going to give you much of a femoral tibial instability and it is very tough to identify that laxity in various flexion internal rotation and you can just walk away over it so again uh, nenda going back to you you have this kind of stuff and going on you have some sort of uh, avulsion at the femoral attachment of mcl how do you sort of bail out this is a very common complication right the most common complication what i see is this avulsion of uh, medial collateral ligament Mostly when I'm operating with this uh, rheumatoid knees, or if you don't pro properly balance a, a varus knee, uh, when you're doing a trial, uh, when you extend and flexion it, uh, if you don't balance them properly, most of the times you find this small avulsion from the medial side. Mm -hmm. Unless uh, sometimes it's a it's a good to have that. How would you address this? Is my question. Hello. How would you address this complication? If if my trial is looking good and uh, the stable knee i just leave it uh, but sometimes rarely if it is a medial opening is there i just put a screw and uh, leave at this point of time and because most of the times i do a ps and rarely i go for a constraint poly uh, for this small avulsion on the mcl yeah small amount of avulsions like this either they can be left as such or you can put one or two cast screws with washer and replace them we all see a lot of those because we have a lot of osteoporotic osteopenic bones and normally they do not require a very special intervention just screws holds them well and uh, ps gives you a sort of a bail out over doing a cr in these cases but yes for an expert majority cases can even be tackled with a cr knee notching that we normally see across normally you can leave it i'll just summarize that any notching that is less than 3 mm or not going through the dark cortex just don't worry about it but if there is a significant notching more than 3 mm or full thickness of medial cortex you have to understand that you are going to leave a high stress area and there is going to potential reduction of torsional strength by 30 to 40% and flexural strength by 18% now this goes on to my dear friend avtar avtar you have been working a big way on through the emerging technologies over the past in navigation as well as robotics this is not an uncommon situation we used to have those thick threaded pins into the femur and the tibia you are seeing and putting a pin and when you sort of extend the knee you have a sort of a fracture in that area you must have gone through these complications how did you address those see uh, manoj uh, nice talking to you uh normally when i started with uh, navigation i used to put my pins in the femur much above the uh, incision line and same way much below the incision line on the tibial side and i always uh, try to put uh, unicortical pins so that normally avoids your fractures but i had uh, three fractures uh, in my practice during last 15 years when i started with navigation and now with robotics all fractures uh, were with navigation one was in the tibial diaphysis which i nailed from uh, above below i mean anterior nailing then i had a fracture uh, in the tibial uh, shaft again much below the prosthesis which i plated and then one fracture where i had to revise the tibial component with a stamp this is how i uh, sorted out all my fractures yeah majority of these fractures you rightly said would require some sort of an intervention or a fixation which uh, normally is a reduction in using these kind of uh, distal femoral locking plates but yes you have other options to fix up and it is a femur same way for the tibia for a couple of those very geriatric fractures if they get through and uh, the patient is not very highly ambulatory you can even try a uh, conservative this is one of the cases we tried conservative with a immobilization for 2 to 3 months and developed a good deal of callus but that's not the normal protocols normally for majority of them would require this kind of a distal femoral locking plate and uh, fixation now depends that uh, if you are going to have a double column fracture then you require double plates i agree with manoj i had one patient with this kind of fracture which you just showed 
I advised her surgery, but she was adamant that I need a plaster, and she was perfectly fine after three months. So, whenever using plates, use a longer working length. Use bicortical purchase. Try to have screws rather than just the cables. Uh, bicortical purchase is best. Even if not, then unicortical purchase along with long shaft screws. Try atraumatic techniques with indirect reduction. This is a message very common. We have seen a lot of our friends doing this kind of a reverse impaction, taking out the femoral trial. In osteoporotic bones, this is one of the catastrophe that can put you to a lot of trouble. Use this kind of extractors as a first parameter. Similarly, for the tibial fractures, we all have seen that when you have a compacted uh, medial side, many times when you are trying to broach in or you are trying to impact in, you have these kind of fractures. Unwanted, uncalled for, and the trouble sometimes is if you do not have backups available on table, be it the tibial extenders or these kind of uh, plates. Same time, uh, when you have these kind of uh, intraop tibial fractures developing in, how do you address those, uh, Nelin? Best way is to avoid it. <laughs> True. So, so be very, very careful whenever you are putting the tibial component, there is no need to hammer it, you know, vigorously. Just place it gently, place your femoral component, put in the trial insert and get the tibia to settle. But obviously, if you have some fracture like this, you will have to fix it. Yeah. And uh, this uni that you have shown, I think it would be better to revise it on table to a total. And uh, I think this total knee with a stem that you have shown, probably I will put an extra plate on the medial side here to mm -hmm. stabilize it. I think wonderfully summarized. Majority of them would require screws or an extractor along with that. And a couple of them would require a supportive plate. So to summarize, vertical metaphysal fractures due to impaction. If they are stable and non-displaced, you fix them with one to two screws. If they are unstable and displaced, screws plus stem, as uh, Nelin rightly told you. I had, Nelin, this kind of a fracture. Uh, Victor, I don't know whether you've seen those. We have our very small ladies, and when you use size 1 or 2, like example, Gen 2 tibia, they have a long uh, keel, which in the last impaction was hitting onto the posterior cortex and had this fracture on the table, which I had no choice into wire through because no stem would bypass this area. Luckily, she healed. And that was one of the prototypes when I was designing the anthem knee. I designed a much smaller keel. But this is one of the complications. I'm very sure a couple of our friends see with a certain kind of implant for short statured females. So now, uh, this for you, uh, Dr. Hulse. 69-year-old female with obesity, BMI around 30-35. Diabetes, mellitus on antidepressants, OA grade 4, both knees. Uh, we did take our left knee. We were pretty fast. Tourniquet time was 25 minutes. But four hours after surgery, we had a situation where our distal pulses were becoming feeble. Capillary feel for more than two seconds. Calf tenderness, decreased sensation. Ankle toe movements decreased. What would come to your spine? I mean, uh, this is a, a typical of a vascular injury. That's why it's uh, very critical that, you know, we identify them immediately just after the surgery. Uh, either in the recovery, you, you know, have a protocol to check the distal pulse or have a, you know, a pulse oximeter or a Doppler done on them as a protocol. So we need a further assessment of this patient, ideally with the help of a vascular surgeon who will probably assess this patient with a, a, an arterial Doppler or a, an or a, a color Doppler. And wow. then, you know, from that point of view, we will take uh, further and uh, most likely it's a, a vascular injury uh, needing some immediate attention. So this was a popliteal artery thrombosis. We, as you rightly said, went in for immediate Doppler, which showed left popliteal artery did not show any color flow in the mid distal part, was thrombosed. Uh, with the vascular, we went in for CT angio, which showed uh, non-opacification and two centimeters of thrombus. Immediately was taken in, we found two centimeter thrombus they moved it through, the skin started becoming warm and the patient was doing well. But over the next three to four days, despite using heparin and other anticoagulants and other medical management, she still started deteriorating and we had a rethrombosis of left popliteal artery. 
did fashiot me is try to save it but ultimately unfortunately as what the withdrawal so said we had no other choice uh, than to unfortunately give her above knee amputation so take them very very carefully despite doing all those things even then despite you will be can be unlucky usually uh, they have a uh, inter injury hmm. and uh, the thrombectomy alone may not be of help yes. and a uh, lot of this vascular surgery is due anastomos directly doctor uh, anu can i can i say something i nowadays we are shortening uh, and shortening the length of the state of the patients we're trying to send it home uh, here we are sending home a day of surgery so we have to be extra careful with these patients because just checking the pulses can can bring a uh, red flag to you and you can prevent if you send one of these patients home and comes 3 days after you you know you just have to amputate from from scratch so true so this was again the next case of a fused knee we tried to reconstruct was totally fused adherent patellectomized stiff we could achieve in bending but couple of hours after surgery she was still bleeding this guy was bleeding and when we went to for ngo we found that there was some sort of a perforation in the popliteal artery this is one thing you will be very very careful for these kind of situations where you have a lot of stiff and adherent knees you need to protect and be careful like for a left knee i would suggest to the younger surgeons try to avoid 1 uh, cm area lateral to the midline where you have the neurovascular areas and if you have a throbbing pulsations that means you are perforated into the popliteal artery by your homens or your saw something of that sort we had to turn the patient upside down and uh, repair the popliteal artery by the vascular team so be very very cautious remember that these things can come on don't try to fiddle across from the front of the knee because you're not able to reach into the tear turn the patient upside down and formulate and repair this artery to to summary of this uh, vascular injury it's a rare but like limb threatening complications of tkr and incidence of 0.03 to 0.5% hemorrhage you can discover intraoperatively after tunica deflation if you have a direct penetrating trauma you can cause hemorrhage pseudomyelitis or av fistula but indirect blunt trauma with a hot cement or a tourniquet or a manipulation can cause edematous plaque and uh, thrombolytic complications now going on to extended tendon injuries we had this kind of a failed arthrodized left knee coming to us for revision this was her picture we knew the conditions she is going to have a tough exposure poor bone quality but luckily infection was not there expectations we try to tone it down now addressing this i am just going to summarize you normally would use extensile exposures like a tto i was not very hopeful that tto will work for this kind of a parameter we try to move in as such we had some sort of uh, avulsion of the base of uh, patellar tendon still patella baha does persist on we did a trans osseous repair so the ways to move across is considering extensile exposures right in the beginning not just the snip that we did for this case but maybe a tibial to burkel osteotomy would have been a better learning point so these damages and extensive tendon can happen during the deformation of patella mid tendon using a saw blade cut that you can accidentally put in or like in this case during exposures and avulsion of tibial tibial attachment but majority of these can be repaired with cross osseous sutures so all of us see these kind of patellofemoral instabilities and you need to look in whether you have put uh, internal rotation of the tibial or the femoral component or the patellar component if all of three are fine you have to do a lateral dead neck lowers release to check on that there is no thumb technique and the patella seats very well into the trochlear sulcus now going on this to now put it across to nilin you have yes. this kind of a bilateral not very uncommon for indian systems you have an adherent mcl and uh, very various knee with a bone collapse also you try to circumvent around the medial side do all sorts of parameters your deep mcl is already released in the beginning 7 mm is released on you went on and uh, you did a kilectomy and uh, osteophytectomy everything is done you still have a trapezoidal part you went to cause an osteotome releasing crucial mcl suddenly you have a click and your knee is a bit unstable in flexion what is your working diagnosis manoj last 2 minutes please okay yeah the scenario that you are describing is a disruption of the mcl yeah so so here what i would see is that whether it is completely unstable or partly unstable 
and whether I have released the PCL or I have not released the PCL. If I have not yet released the PCL, even if the MCL partly disrupted, I think a normal insert would work reasonably well. But if the PCL is also disrupted, then I would probably try to go in for some kind of higher constraint. Good. So normally, a message for audience is normally a PS does not work if you have an instability still persisting. There you have to have a various valgus constraint or a PS plus kind of an intervention. You have these kind of pictures where you have stretchings of the MCL, and you need to check on the status. Be very careful when you use these kind of small sort of rectangular blocks in trapezoidal large size bones where your blade is free and can damage the popliteus or your collaterals. We had a case in which there was accidental cutting of uh, MCL. and a free uh, semi t graft was used across another where uh, semi t augmentation was also done so in all those cases you can repair your mcls or you can augment them with semi t across in these cases similarly for acute valgus flexion deformities your peroneal nerve can also have a compression guru i'll just take 2 minutes and i'll sort of close the working points so this is in the sizing of the implants complication you use the normal implants and you have this kind of an overhang which in couple of cases beyond a certain millimeters can be you can build out with narrow trochlear implants similarly on the tibia if you have an impingement despite using the very small sizes pressing on the postlateral corner you can use asymmetric tibias and walk off it so in all these things you can prevent those failures you can use extensile or short means but if you still have failures of these mechanisms victor has nicely summarized the propylene mesh that you can use on you can use this kind of uh, containment with ss wires also for a secondary reinforcement now the last complication that i have seen across the last few months is only pertinent to the indian system my indian friends victor would have never ever seen it and this i called as a covid 19 indian complication Where you enter the OT and you get to know you don't have this size of tibia, this size of fibula, this size of patella, and insert because of the COVID supplies have been short. Our India system is not very profitable for the industry, and I'm very sure coming from the heart, majority of us are facing these kind of uh, implant shortages, which in itself are coupling to complications. With this, uh, I open the desk across any questions from the uh, fellow colleagues or panelists. We are more than happy to answer. thank you manoj that's a wonderful preparation of the talk really summarized very well and victor great talk from you it's a really very important uh, relevant talk in topic to complication that's why we given this time and now manoj don't go anywhere and victor please stay back for another half an hour we are very patient the whole morning because we both want you to be in the panel now i will pass it to ashok to conduct the penultimate session revision total knee arthroplasty ashok all yours thank you uh, thank you guruva uh, so without further ado it's my great pleasure to invite uh, two of my very good friends esteemed colleagues uh, vastly experienced in the science of arthroplasty for many many years uh, the first talk is by uh, dr vikram shah who heads an institution uh, he is an institution in himself uh, shall be group of hospitals and he's going to talk to us on the principles of revision totally arthroplasty good all yours vikram yes sir so we have a pre recorded one which we are going to play back now yep i am going to talk about principles of revision knee arthroplasty today evening revision is required in total knee replacement for so many reasons from a septic loosening to mechanical failure to infected uh, knees we are not going to talk about infection in knees we will consider a septic loosening and mechanical failure with well fixed implant as far as uh, mechanical failure is concerned mainly overstop joint or ligament balance problem and on long run uh, you get uh, implant loosening because of various reasons nowadays uh, several new implants so we are getting it uh, uh, loose implants uh, just in 3 to 5 years time like uh, a tune rt <coughs> or a tune fixed bearing 
Now, most important part is how to approach uh, this uh, difficult uh, problem is uh, preoperative evolution and planning, surgical exposure, removal of well fixed implant, and assessment of soft tissue integrity on table before deciding the level of constraint required. And then balancing it in full flexion extension as well as joint line and also rotation. Uh, one thing I would love to mention here is uh, uh, there are four main races in the world uh, where uh, Africans have the strongest tissue, strongest bones, and we South Asians have uh, precarious tissues, particularly in this age group, as well as bone. And this makes it a little more difficult on table. Uh, Pre-operative planning and evaluation of knee is basically required so as to plan what you will need on table. You can see medial collateral ligament is gone. You definitely need to have an RHK type of joint. You cannot reconstruct this joint any other way. Lexity on lateral collateral side, you can still get away with 30C3 or constraint type of joint. Aseptic loosening and instability because of that, you can fill up the implant or you can use RHK type of joint. Uh, pre operative evaluation, more important part is in quadricep mechanism. If your quadricep mechanism is not good, even if your EMG and NCV is normal, there are chances that you will have a good uh, leg, good fibrosis in the gutters and you will not know that actually there is a quadricep problem or so there is something else and you really need to find out because if you do not have good quadricep, you need to put RHK. You cannot salvage with uh, little constraint. Before you start and get into surgery, you should be fairly sure that you are not dealing with infection because all reports are normal and still you might have infection. So on table also you require to have a suspicious eyes and mind. Now, this is more important than surgery itself, how you expose your knee because it has to be gradual and slow and methodical and you open up the joint, clear gutters, clear uh, different areas of joint before you dislocate the patella. And you flex 5-10 degrees at a time and every time you have to see to it that you are able to differentiate between fibrous tissue and the important ligaments. I, medial collateral and tibial tuberosity attachment of patella tendon, these two are the most important parts. And uh, required rectus leak, do it beforehand rather than later on. Now it is very important to avoid hasty and impotent exposure and before dislocating tibia anteriorly you need to have a full exposure of the medial side of the tibia that is anterior medial, medial and posterior medial otherwise there are chances that you will lose your medial collateral ligament in one or the other way. If your bone is weak you will lose it from the medial Epicondyle, if your ligament is weak, midst of chest tear, particularly in RA, and if you are not able to differentiate between fibrous tissue and middle collateral ligament, in a good strong tissue, it will get away from tibial origin. Now, in surgical exposure, uh, you need to patella dislocate the patella laterally. At that, for that, you have to go really laterally before dislocating or before trying to dislocate you go laterally you clear the gutter and then go down enough so that there is nothing in between in patella dislocation and before you dislocate before you dislocate you put a pin so that to avoid evil zone of patella tendon you can see the pin here how you can save and before dislocating, if you need, go for a sleep beforehand. Now, 
how to remove of well fixed implant with minimum bone loss and soft tissue injury choose proper instruments reciprocating saw gilly wire saw oscillating saw and thin broad osteotome so these are the things available to you and you can see how you can use each of them to remove well fixed implants and the key is don't lose bone and don't lose important soft tissue ligaments now assessment of the soft tissue once you have removed the implants you have to assess it and decide the level of constraint and whether you will do go ahead with posture stabilize or constraint or the hinge once you decide that this is how you can end up when you are putting long stems it is easy that your sagittal and coronal uh, alignment will come properly it is the rotation which is going to be important here we are talking about uh, level of constraint required this rhk joint now the rotational alignment is very important because that is where we need to see it properly before we decide the implant and we need to decide the flexion gap also this is about uh, deciding the joint line where uh, distance from the epicondyle or distance from the tibial tuberosity can be considered to see it now restoring the joint line is also very important part in revision and uh, we just spoke about it so now every time you do revision there is a disproportionate increase in flexion gap to extension gap and uh, that is a issue all the time and one has to be very very, very careful about this and you might need to put a larger femur with a larger posterior augment to reduce the flexion gap these are some cases thank you uh, so you have muted uh, dr rajagopal so sure, unmute yes thank you thank you i understand uh, dr vikram is not there in person but thank um, uh, his team for the presentation um, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, our current president who actually demits in 24 hours to my other good friend gurva and hemant is going to talk to us about decluttering sleeves bones Uh, cones and stems in revision toward me arthroplasty uh, hemant comes from uh, dinanath mangeshkar hospital where he heads the arthroplasty division hemant all yours thank you ashok it's wonderful to be part of this great program uh, that is shot out by gurva uh, my brief is to declutter uh, stems sleeves and cones uh, and i think these are very important tools in revision knee arthroplasty and if you believe that you are going into war you really need all all that is there in the armamentarium that you have available so it's a war uh, that you going in for so you want to have everything available to you i think bone loss is the biggest challenge in revision total knee arthroplasty and even if you look at uh, type 1 uh, bone loss a grade 1 bone loss uh, here even in this situation ultimately the load transfer that's going to take place is dependent on the cement bone interface and with this kind of uh, bone at the level of the joint you're still not uh, very happy with the kind of cement bone interface you're going to have and effectively the load transfer load transfer you would uh, rely on the stems in such situations and most of the times these are the kind of stems that you rely on we ream uh, both a uh, femoral and tibial sides we want to establish the endosteal bony contact with the stem as you can see here on the tibial side and even on the femoral side and uh, then effectively uh, you are happy that the reasonable bone transfer load transfer will take place uh, through the diaphysis 
and uh, the metaphyseal or even the joint level uh, cement bone interface won't be stressed too much and it will have a good longevity of that implant. So let's consider what are the options that are available with the stems. Now stems most of the times in total knee arthroplasty that we use are uh, smooth and polished. Very rarely, uh, this kind that uh, I showed earlier, very rarely you would have grid blaster and most of the times grid blaster stems are used for arthrodesis nails like this. And these are titanium stems uh, that are aiming for bony on growth. And that is what, uh, the, so the purpose here is quite different. And you very you know you don't have these kind of stems uh, that are used in the total knee arthroplasty. So second thing is about the length of the stems. You can have short stubby stem like this that is going to be fully cemented both uh, here as you can see on the tibial and femoral side. You can have medium length as I've shown earlier or you can have a very long stem that is again going to be engaging in, in the diaphysis uh, of the bone. Now these stems could be fully cemented or just metaphyseal cementing. Now, if you are using a medium length strength, uh, medium stem length, as you are seeing here, I, my personal choice is not to have the entire length cemented for a simple reason that, as uh, somebody said earlier, you have to think of the next surgery that potentially might be needed. And if you end up cementing the entire diaphysis uh, with, the, with this kind of stems, then it's going to be a nightmare trying to take the cement out if you have to at any stage. So most of the times, my, my preference in this sense is uh, just have metaphyseal cementing and have endosteal bony contact with uh, uncemented portion of a smooth uh, poly stem, as you are seeing here. So that is the metaphyseal cementing that is my preference. But of course, there are situations where you need to fully cement. One is when you use a short stubby stem that will has to be fully cemented. And there is another instance that I'll show you in a minute. And another option that we have with stems is whether you use a straight stem or an offset stem. We'll see that in a minute. Now, you have a situation like this. It's a periprosthetic fracture. And uh, uh, when you come to reconstructing it, there is no metaphysis left at all. All you're left is staring is diaphysis. And in these situations, you have to fully cement the stems in. And in fact, fully cement the stems in with a cement restrictor. And as you can see here, the cement restrictor on top and this stem is entirely cemented in. And that's the only way you can get decent uh, stability with this. And, uh, you know, uh, you can have a good outcome with this kind of uh, situation. The next option is that whether you use a straight stem or an offset stem. Now, straight stems have a tendency of dictating the position of the prosthesis on the end of the bone. For example, as you can see here on the femoral side, the femoral component is lateralized. Now, uh, uh, offset stem, as you can see on the right hand side, is what is going to allow your uh, prosthesis to be centralized on the bone in medial lateral plane. And because it can you know, rotate 360 degrees, you can even have a better position uh, anterior posteriorly as well. And the same situation is true on the tibial side as well. And you can decide this position using uh, you know, what is the optimum position during surgery while you are using the reamer. Now, another choice that is available with some uh, implant manufacturers is having a split stem. And as you can see here, the split stem on the femoral side, you can have similar on the tibial side as well. Now, split stems actually give you a good endosteal contact and give you a good torsional stability as well. And because, uh, you know, here you can see the example of offset stem on the tibial side as well. Now, one point to note on the offset stems is that the shoulder or where the offset stem engages with the tibial base plate. Uh, that point of contact depends on the height of the tibial base plate and tibial uh, you know, component actually uh, if it is too uh, tall then the, this point of contact is going to be much below and sometimes in small size tibia that is a problem with the shoulder of this uh, construct hitting the uh, endosteal side and that can have its own problems. So there are newer uh, processes designs where the tibial base plate is pretty short and that actually the shoulder of this construct is actually uh, goes high and into the wider region of the metaphysis. So that's quite useful uh, using this kind of construct. Let's come to sleeves now. Now sleeves are metaphysial uncemented uh, structures that have a scratch fit in the metaphysial area. And they are used uh, in combination with uncemented intramedullary stems or sometimes without a stem as well. Now these sleeves, especially the one that is seen here is perhaps the most popular one that's from Depew. And it has a porous coated sleeve area that is intended for bony in growth, as you can see. That almost is about 30-40% of the sleeve is having a porous coated area. I'm just going to show you one example of that. You know, here is a patient, uh, again, uh, had no metaphysis left here, only diaphysis left. 
and this uh, femur is being broached uh, to accept that sleeve and this is at the end of the broach and that is the component going in with uh, the uncemented stem uh, being uh, put on and uh, that is a sleeve that is engaged there and similarly on the tibial side and as you can see here these are the processes that were implanted this is a noyles hinge that was used and the area of the porous coating is only about 30 40% of the entire sleeve so it's only a small area of the bone that is engaging with uh, the the host bone and that is the area where you are hoping for osseo integration and that actually allows uh, for uh, load transfer uh, down the metaphysis now it's important to appreciate that whatever cement gets used for example here on the tibial side there is some cement being used that is actually cosmetic because this tibial base plate is actually have going to have a more stepper inside the sleeve and that is how the uh, you know uh, the tibial base plate engages or fixes into the sleeve and this cement is for cosmetic purpose only for a good looking x-ray otherwise you could use uh, uh, you could you could use no cement there and you would see a gap on the x-ray let's consider cones now there are these are again metaphyseal filling structures now there are two types that are uh, available one is structures that are aimed at bony integration on surface only and second is uh, second type of cones is aimed as uh, structural bone substitution now these are the ones that are introduced by striker these are triathlon titanium cone augments they are made up of titanium where you are expecting to have bony ingrowth onto the surface only so these are not actually uh, bone substitution but uh, aiming for uh, like an uncemented implant having bony on growth and ingrowth on the surface only whereas the trabecular metal that was introduced by zimmer is a femoral cone augment and this actually is a bone substitution material it is made up of tantalum and this is excellent uh, material that is open cell structure and high volumetric porosity of almost 80% low modulus of elasticity so that is perfect to use with subchondral bone and surface coefficient of friction is extremely high and bony ingrowth is seen uh, very well with the trabecular metal and uh, there are various kinds of uh, shapes that are available for example here on the femoral side you can see it, um, femoral uh, cone one example on the tibial side big tibial defect in the medial side is the trial cone in place and uh, actual tibial cone in place now it's better to cover the outer side of this cone with cement because these are uh, quite irritant to the soft tissues that is the post operative x ray and a uh, five year follow up of the same patient a uh, difficult case with supracondylar non union with uh, arthritis again it's uh, uh, like there is no only diaphysis remaining so cone has been used to reconstruct the distal femur and a hinge has been placed on top that is the post operative x ray of the same patient and that's a 6 year follow up of the same patient you can see that uh, bone was hypertrophied whereas the cone cone is engaging and that tells you that the blood transfer is taking place very well now there are various shapes options that are available with tibian cones as well the problem sometimes is with the size of indian bones that are available one just one example of tibial cones being used tibial uh, that is collapsed completely and uh, these are intraoperative pictures sh showing a diaphyseal cone cone going in and that is how it is fixed in place and then in inside this is the tibial component that is cemented inside and that's how it was reconstructed so tibial uh, metaphyseal cones have to be considered as bone substitution options rather than implant components and to summarize i think these are all essential tools for revision arthroplasty each is going to serve a specific function and one has to really understand the utility and most of these revision tks are going to need stem so one can decide about, about the type of stem and the length of the stem that is required and is in addition to the stems is independent on the dependent on the amount of bone loss and the stability that is necessary thank you very much thank you hemant uh, that was a very erudite uh, presentation on a very interesting topic uh, what we going to do in the next uh, maybe 20 25 minutes is we have four panelists uh, dr narayan hulse dr avtar singh dr nilan and uh, dr narin reddy and if manoj vadwa victor hernandez also is there or there okay right um, i stand corrected dr uh, uh, victor and uh, dr manoj vadwa so we have six panelists and um, uh, what we're going to do is have each of our four panelists that i mentioned earlier present cases you have 2 minutes for presentation and then we will discuss amongst the panelists so dr narayan hulse would i uh, 
could I request you to uh, do the first case? Very brief presentation, and then we'll have a discussion around it, and we'll integrate the talks from uh, Dr. Hemant and uh, uh, Dr. Vikram Shah, though he's not here, we'll try and get some questions and answers going. Please, please uh, present your case, Dr. Alse. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and uh, everybody for uh, having me an opportunity here today. Uh, this is a, a simple one of the cases which uh, uh, propped up into my OPD about an year ago. 68-year-old female who had a bilateral knee replacement six years ago in the city. She was always happy with the left knee, but, but complained about the right knee all the time. She had pain, recurrent swelling, and also difficulty in getting up from the chair. And you know, she was always unhappy, whereas uh, she has been told that you, know, you do more exercise, more physiotherapy, you'll be all right for a long time. And uh, recently, she presented to my OPD after five years. She's only hypertensive. She has uh, 0 to 120 degree. It's lax knee. In general, it's varus. And you can see the dryer test, both anterior posterior were positive and it's a lax knee, obviously, of a, you know, a indication of some instability. So this is how on clinical examination, well healed scar, not much of swelling, but obvious gross instability in the knee. So these are the x-rays, the AP and lateral views and the long standing x-rays. We have ESR 21, CRP 7. We have done a knee aspiration, uh, which has grown no organisms. Bone scan and the CT scan was not done in this case. And uh, I would like to you know, discuss with the panel what could be the best next option available for this patient. Right, uh, Dr. Olsen. I think uh, that's the, probably the right point to stop. So. Let me let me ask uh, first of all, uh, Hemant. Hemant, uh, do do you aspirate all your knees undergoing revision surgery? Is that a part of your protocol? Well, clinically, if uh, there is anything to you know raise the suspicion of infection, I would definitely aspirate it. But if a patient comes to you who requires a revision but knee feels clinically pretty dry and uh, you know it looks like it to be aseptic uh, clinically i first get their hemogram esr crb done if any of those is high then i would aspirate the knee but so you, if at any chance i think that, yeah. so you do a selective uh, transition of patients uh, in terms of aspiration for infection uh, dr hernandez is that your protocol as well Is Dr. Hernandez there? Victor, I think uh, he's not there. All right. Sir, Dr. Uh, Victor so, is not there, sir. Okay, okay he's not there. So, Ma Manoj, is, uh, what, do you routinely aspirate your knees or is it selective? What do you do? Uh, not sure. Uh, for all cases going in for a revision and where I'm considering a reimplantation, I always uh, aspirate those knees before. And okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Aftar, is that your... Do you also do that? No, my protocol is like Dr. Hemant. If okay. we have a raised CRP, ESR, then I aspirate, otherwise I don't aspirate. All right. Okay, so Dr. Hulse, let's move on. What did you... Yes. Yeah, what so, did you... See, I had an option of an aseptic and a, a, a lax knee. A poly exchange, which is the simple, simplest procedure, you just change the poly, thicker poly, or change it to a PS option because it was a CR, or a revision, either it's a partial or a constraint. So I opened the knee and this was the picture. You can see a lot of metallosis giving an alarm that the metal is affected as well. So that is how it works. The of single components has given consistently poor results and there's been a very wide yes. uh, uh, refusal, if you will, of uh, selective single component revision in the Australian Registry of uh, 19 yeah. report. So I think you've actually done this very, very elegantly, and uh, thank you. That's that's that is a wonderful case. Um, can we now, in the thank interest you. of time, move on to, to the second case that's going to be presented by Dr. Reddy? Uh, 
Narendra, would you like to send us uh, give us your case? Presentation. So, Doctor yeah. Reddy. Yes, sir. I'm I'm ready with my case. So, good evening, all of you. I thank uh, Doctor Guruva Reddy for uh, and uh, Doctor Ashok Raj Gopal for this opportunity. So, here I'm going to present a case of a. a uh, So, yeah. hmm? Dr. Reddy, looks like your internet is a little poor. We are. Not, uh, have you started sharing your screen, sir? I'm just getting a frozen image. No, 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 sir. I'm just about to start. Uh, Can you start video. sharing your presentation, please? Yes, sir. I'm ready to do that, but uh, there are some issues with the uh, with the internet, sir. I think you're having I'm a problem. Ready. It's all on red. Yeah. So, Ashok, you got another yeah. case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, while we are waiting for that, uh, can I request Dr. Aftar's uh, you know? case, please? Can you, uh, Dr. Aftar? Uh, Dr. Narendra Reddy is on, sir. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Reddy. Yeah. Dr. Reddy, can I give a suggestion? Can you uh, uh, cut your video because that will give you better uh, bandwidth? Stop video. Yes, sir. Stop your video, not your presentation. No, no, stop your video. Your we'll do it for you, sir. We'll do it for you. Yeah, go ahead, Narendra. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. So I am from Guntur and uh, presenting a 51 year old uh, female non diabetic and, uh, and hypertensive hypothyroidism and had a uh, right knee replaced six years back and she presented with pain and difficult to walk since two years. And there is no history of any trauma. So there is a healed surgical scar present and no swelling, no signs of inflammation. Uh, when she presented, she presented with valgus deformity of 40 degrees and hyperextension of 20 degrees. And uh, very difficultly, there is a range of movement of 20 to 90 degrees and no neurovascular benefits. So I'm just uh, this is an x ray of immediate post operative when the patient underwent as primary total knee replacement six years back. And uh, these are the follow-up x-rays, whenever she has an opportunity, she has visited and uh, she has taken up a follow-up. There are x-rays like this and you can clearly see there is a um, subluxation. So the knee is absolutely uh, unstable and the patient is almost unable to walk and she's walking uh, with the support of a walker. So uh, this is a posterior stabilized knee and uh, this is what she presented and this is the uh, 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 clinical picture intraoperatively here you can see when i've taken her for the revision surgery this is the uh, uh, valgus and hyper extinction what she had and uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, when i opened the knee i realized that there is uh, the fracture of the tibial spine and uh, absolutely unstable knee and uh, but the tibia is well fixed, so I removed it, and uh, this is what the poly looked like with the fractured uh, um, uh, intra picture of that x ray, and uh, this is, has been done. So, uh, Dr. Reddy, a question to you. Uh, did she did she develop this hyperextension post operatively after a while or was this uh, almost immediately after surgery do you have any history of that the patient says the knee look uh, instable from the day she has operated but she yeah. maintained that she has uh, a limual uh, instability she had and she maintained with that for the 3 to 4 years right. but she reached a stage where uh, she was not able to walk I right. just want to bring clinical picks. This is what uh, probably uh, the preoperatively the right limb also looked in the same way, a very bad um, valgus knee and uh, very hyperextensible joints. She has a very lax joints. Uh, so she has presented with this uh, fracture of the tibial spine. So. So, Nilan, uh, do you do you want to dwell on this and and give us your your perspective of what what you think went wrong, and what you would have done differently? See, in a PS knee, 
correcting such a deformity on table sometimes you feel that the post and because of the post the knee is appearing stable but the post cannot really take all the loads so if the knee is not perfectly balanced and if it is going in a little bit of hyper extension the post is eventually going to break so ashok being your ardent supporter student and disciple i would think that even a valgus knee or more a valgus knee you should preserve the posterior cruciate ligament because it is an important stabilizer of the knee uh, so primarily i would have probably done a pcl uh, preserving knee right okay uh, <clears throat> i think i can uh, you know come in here and uh, would say that don't blame the ps knee for uh, the you know the outcome that is not that is not the reason for his failure sorry <laughs> yeah so uh, i'm i mean uh, honestly i think uh, both systems work well i think where uh, where i think uh, things started to go wrong was because of this instability that uh, uh, evidently persisted after the surgery the hyper extension knocked off the the post and um, i i think something of this degree with the weight that we are carrying some sort of a stem in this implant would have been possibly a better option manoj would you have done anything differently i think uh, shuk this was a case where right from the beginning there would have been some sort of a mid flexion instability and with pushed on to this part i think if it fails like this you have a post gone and you have no choice than to revise and add three components which was done the right way If right. I can just chat in a little bit, sir. Can, sir, is it okay if I just ask this question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, sir. Could it be anything to do with the uh, cross-linking of the polyethylene? I think that was a striker liner, and that is a highly cross-linked polyethylene line, if I'm correct. Is it, sir? Because uh, cross-linking does increase its uh, brittleness or break. Yeah, but in this particular case, with a kind of disruption of the cam, this is typically a hyperextension injury, where the uh, where the cam and post have actually been rubbing and it's got basically trial it's like an amputation of the of the cam i i think the lesson to learn here is possibly to you have used a slightly more robust implant possibly with a little bit more constraint given the initial instability and uh, possibly um, a little bit of uh, uh, correction of the hyper extension that may have presented this Uh, i would certainly have used a stemmed implant here uh, at least on one side to take away the stresses but uh, i i think uh, narend you did a excellent job of uh, correcting this instability and the deformity so thank th thank you very much uh, may i now invite uh, I, have to, i have to operate the other knee so good luck Sir, I would like to operate on the other knee. What is what is the uh, what is you suggest me at this opposite knee? Uh, I I would I would given given her history I would go in straight and put in a LCCK on this side. She is grossly unstable. Her MCL is stretched out. I would cut my losses and I would go in and do a primary LCCK here. Now, yeah, Ashok, next one. Uh, next is Doctor uh, Avtar Singh. Uh, Avtar, could you kindly? Sure. Or you got exactly three minutes. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Ajpal and Doctor Reddy. Uh, I'll be presenting one patient. Uh, uh, a fifty-five-year male, short-statured, obese patients, and he had uh, uh, multiple level malunions. Uh, on left side and uh, in the femur and multiple level malunions on the tibia on the right side so a difficult primary and this is how it looked like and the scanogram shows multiple level deformities malunited fractures and i did the right side uh, navigated tkr after reconstructing the medial tibial condyle with autologous bone graft and this is how he looked like one year follow up uh, he was doing perfectly fine and then one fine day he had a fall and he came to me about a month after the fall so 
So now we stop at this point. Uh, what should we do now at this stage? Uh, you can see the lateral gap opening up. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, yes, you are, uh, uh, Nilen. Could you would you like to take that up and tell say how you would like to proceed there? Uh, I think I would like to take some varus valgus views to see what is going on. Mm -hmm. I see that the lateral gap is opening up, yeah. but I, I, I can't really make out why it is opening up, whether the femur is fractured or, you know. No, uh, there was I think the collateral is gone. gone. Yeah, the collateral is gone. I had a CT scan, which I don't have at the moment, but there was no fracture. Actually. Okay, let's assume that it is unstable, uh, Milan. What would you, what do you do, uh, do going ahead from here? Uh, again, I think lateral ligament laxity may be tolerated. So I would want to examine him, you know, and see how lax it is. If it is, okay, if it is lax, this, it is lax. It's unstable. The patient can't yeah. walk. Yeah. Yeah. Then obviously he needs, he needs uh, some kind of revision. So depending upon what, what implant it is, whether a more stabilized insert is going to go in or not. Or otherwise, a full-scale revision with a constrained implant. Right. Okay. So, uh, you will offer him a revision at this point of time. So that's no, no. what I that's what I offered him. I offered him also that I'll repair your ligament or reconstruct the ligament. But I know the the outcome will not be great. So, so he was not willing for any kind of surgery at this point of time. But came back three months later. Much okay. more unstable now. And he was in a splint put by somebody else. And now he was willing for surgery. So now what kind of surgery we should offer him now at the moment? Um, so Hemant? Yeah, I just wonder whether the femoral component is shifting. Because uh, I, I would like to compare the x-rays with the previous one. Okay, Obviously, yeah. uh, what Neelan suggested, varus valgus stress views would uh, give you a lot more information. So and this is the previous one, and uh, it doesn't show any shifting of the femur. Yeah, the, I think the femur is well fixed. Yeah, it's okay. very well fixed. Well, I mean, it is unstable on the lateral side. It certainly needs uh, revision to a more constrained option. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, if it is worsening over a period of time, you know, you have to explain to the patient. I think counseling will be critical here. Right. Yes. So, 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 Aftar, what did you do for this yeah. patient? I, I decided to revise this, but then there was a dilemma. Of what kind of implant will be suitable to his anatomy, considering a very deformed femur and a curved femur? That was so, my dilemma, actually. So, Aftar, I would, I would do a LCCK with a short, fully cemented stubby stem, okay. and a. Uh, a press fit stem on the tibial side. That's what I would do. Right. Hmm. So now I can show you what I did. I did a, a link processes, which is a conical stem. I could draw the line. I, I could see that I can fit in this uh, implant in the femur. So I had to elevate the joint line because he was very lax in flexion and extension. And this was done in 2015 and this x-ray was taken yesterday, six years after the revision. So he's doing perfectly fine and you can see that conical stem fitting quite nicely. Yeah. And that, uh, that, that is excellent. That is the scanogram yesterday. Uh, Avtar, did you use navigation when you did the revision as well? No, no sir. I never used that okay. uh, during the revision. Yeah. That's wonderful, uh, Dr. Avtar. That's a very difficult problem that you have dealt with very elegantly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, the last case, uh, Nilan, uh, your... Uh, Ashok. Yeah. Uh, Nilan, can you finish off in three minutes without discussion? Guruva, your wish is my command. No, no, sir. It, you it is our command. <laughs> Don't ask for discussion. You just present and uh, finish it off. The next is also case decision. It will be good. Can you all can you all see? No, no Dr. Nilan, you are not shared yet yet. You see your beautiful face with headphones. You can see you only, sir. Your both headphones, I think. 
<laughs> Guru, you refuse to go off the screen. You are so attractive and, uh, and charming. Nobody wants you off the screen. Can you see now? Yes, sir, we can. Uh, yeah. Can you go to the slideshow, please? Yeah. So, firstly, thanks to Guru and Ashok. And two minutes starting now. So, this is a lady, 54 year old, bilateral knee OA, symptoms since three years, mainly medial, no comorbidity, but slightly obese. So, operated somewhere else, as they say in England, sent elsewhere, both knees, 2016. So, left was okay, right, persistently painful, gradually increasing, wound was intact, but high inflammatory markers, clinically was septic, two months from operation. So one question, do bilateral knee replacements have a greater incidence of infection? No. So this review article says no. So at two months, she had a debridement and liner exchange with Vanco cement beads. Culture was negative. The knee was immobilized for a month. She received IV antibiotics. So this success of debridement is more if it is done within the first four weeks. And immobilization post debridement is not requ uh, required. So she developed a stiff knee, manipulated under GA. Patient continued to have pain, swelling and redness. And at six months, she had a sinus. She changed the surgeon. And the new surgeon did this. One month stay in the hospital. And a mobile antibiotic spacer was put. So one year post this she had three further failed debridements. Culture was various, uh, appeared stellite and sometimes CNS was grown. Histopathology was chronic granulomatous infection. Aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, AKT, tetracyclines, everything was used. Infectious disease specialists were called and she was advised fusion. Presented to us after two years, six prior failed surgeries, discharging sinus, immobile, an aminoglycoside induced hearing loss and these were the x-rays. I advised a state surgery, eradication of infection and restitution of function. Oncological debridement, static cement spacer and antibiotic beads. I'll just take 10 seconds on oncological debridement, extend the incision, layered clearance, remove infected and doubtfully infected tissue from all areas clear the gutters, posterior clearance, copious irrigation, three packets of cement, static spacer, antibiotic stimulant beads. She was culture neg negative, oral linozolid and clindamycin for three months post-op. I observed her for six months, sinus healed and x-ray was looking benign. And then I did this hinge with sleeves that Hemant showed with rods and she had an uneventful recovery. She was discharged within a uh, week and these are her six months follow-up x-rays and it's been around one and a half years since surgery and she's doing well. This is a range of movement, markers are normal, no pain. So the take-home message is do the debridement early and in established cases, oncological debridement is required. So her microbiome will remain in mystery till the end. Sorry, Hemant, I missed it. Her microbiology remained a mystery till the end. No, she had grown CNS. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Nilayan. Thank you, all the panelists and Hemant and uh, Vikram in absentia for a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you all very much. Ashok, thank you, Guru. Thank you so much. And now we come to the last session. And uh, this is the clinical case presentation. Uh, moderators being Neelan and Narayan. And a uh, lot of youngsters uh, are knocking the doors for the for prominence in the orthoplasty session. And so Kalpesh from Ahmedabad, Shalbi, Rushi Balodia from Ahmedabad, Vaibhav Jain from Delhi, Harish Guta from Faridabad, and Arsha Josie from Ahmedabad. These are the youngsters who are going to take the limelight next.
and all yours nilen and narayan thank, thank you, you and guru va narayan all yours thank you no no carry on carry on thank you so can we invite kalpesh to yeah. present his case uh, good evening dr nilen sir i am dr pranay i am speaking on behalf of dr kalpesh sir dr kalpesh okay. is not well so i am presenting a case on behalf of him i am one of his colleagues from shelby hospital only okay can i proceed oh, pranay yes sir so pranay 3 minutes come on go on yes yeah, sir move your cursor on the slides and you will get it yeah okay so we are going to uh, see a case of 48 years old female she was having an autoimmune disease with hypothyroidism she was having complaint of uh, instability while walking for almost 6 to 8 months she had a recovery time of 25 degrees and further flexion up to 80 degrees with gross laxity mediolateral this was her pre op x rays we did her work up for inf infection that was clear we did aspirations a month before this x ray uh, it was clear suggestive of no infection so we went ahead with this constraint rhk and patient presented to us after 8 days of surgery with periprosthetic fracture like this actually this case was operated by some other surgeon we received this patient in er with this presentation on 8th day of primary surgery we did plating unfortunately patient started walking before the union and she presented to us after 2 months with fixation failure after 3 months we did dual plating with bone grafting everything went well and fracture was united patient was walking she was absolutely fine for another 2 and 1/2 years one fine morning 2021 january she presented to us with complaint of pain in thigh and again difficulty in walking we did our work up for infection she had raised crp and esr and total count her respiration from the knee was clear so i would like to open the panel for discussion now what we can do in this case further what we can give to this patient can i add yes sir um see there, there are a lot of missing links in this story yes you sir you see there are a lot of gross destruction of the knee even before the first surgery it is not a straight forward arthritis you know it's something else most yes, likely sir. something like a neuropathic type so that should have warned us about the situation what we are going to face in the future that's what i feel it's a neuropathic joint looks like very badly you know yes, the sir. damaged joint and uh, you know that is class book uh, classic textbook why is a contraindication for a knee replacement even though you know there are some studies nowadays which suggest we can do a linked knee then the infection and other things which followed them are obviously because of the you know we have so much of surgical injury the plating and the long stem knee in a neuropathic uh, joint so the sensible options now can be an including a, a chronic uh, antibiotic suppression or even an amputation which has to be really discussed with the patient can you hear me yes sir yeah sir what do you say dr uh, shah yeah uh, i think amputation may be a little bit drastic some kind of implant removal and maybe attempted fusion may be a better thing yeah so so let us know what you have done uh, we have done nothing at present uh, we just saw that patient few days back in our clinic uh 
I think we have not advised at present to the patient anything further, but uh, we may go for fusion or we may go for amputation. And also you can see the femoral component is looking already loose. Yes, and, yes it and, is loose. And uh, you know, it's a clear story of a neuropathic joint. Yes, and I think even the first x-ray that he yeah. showed, there was a fracture even on the first post-operative x-ray. Yeah. So the... I'll show you, sir, again. I think the lesson here is that if something is appearing not routine, yeah, don't consider it routine. <laughs> okay, agree. thanks for your case. Thank next. you, sir. Maybe... Narayan, can we proceed for the next, yes. next person? Uh, so the, the slight uh, changes in the agenda here. So the next will be by Dr. Deepak Thakur, Senior Consultant from Women's Nayati Super Speciality Hospital. Deepak, are you ready? Dr. Deepak yes, Thakur? Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir, I am ready. You can go ahead, yeah. yeah. Okay, good evening, everybody. I thank the organizer for giving me a chance to present uh, my case at ISHKS. My case is a uh, case of an extra-articular deformity and a role of navigation in this kind of cases. Uh, my patient was a 48-year-old young female uh, having advanced secondary osteoarthritis of both the knees. She had sustained a road traffic accident around 25 years back uh, with injury to both the legs. She was treated conservatively with a plaster cast as she was five months pregnant at that time. That was in 1995. Both the TBL shaft fractures malunited subsequently. She had, she started walking and she had an instability on the right knee for which an ACL reconstruction was done. Also, she had underwent an illusory for limb lengthening on the right side, which was subsequently removed in 1998. So the patient presented to us with gross virus deformity and an antalgic gait. The virus was around 20 degrees on the right side and 15 degrees on the left. She was having a hyperextension of minus 5 and range of motion was from minus 5 to 110. These were her pre-operative x-rays with which she presented to us. You can see the malunited fractures of the tibia and the advanced arthritis in both the knees. This was the lateral x-rays and this was the long leg view which is showing a gross virus on the right and a virus on the left too. These were her clinical pictures and this was her gait. So issues in this case were that she was a young female with secondary advanced osteoarthritis with a severe virus and uh, and having an extra articular deformity that is the malunited shaft table fractures. Now points to be considered in this case was whether we should go in for a single stage procedure that is an intra-articular correction with ligament balancing or a simultaneous extra articular osteotomy with the TKR or a two stage procedure that is an extra articular osteotomy first followed by a TKR later on. So that was the decision making and what kind of uh, what role will navigation play in this case so uh, this shows uh, the kind of the uh, plan that has to be taken into account that if there is a uh, malunited femoral side we have to see the competency of the ligament uh, similarly on the tibia if we extend the line from the mid shaft if, if the line is passing through the condyles then one we can go in for an intra-articular correction if just passing outside when we should stage it actually. So this was our case. On the right side, it was extending outside and on the left side, it was extended inside. So we planned it out accordingly. At the first stage we did was a navigated left side total knee replacement and uh, on the left, on the right side, we did a osteotomy. So this was a post-op X-ray on the left side with a navigated TKR, a CR implant, the lateral view. The right side we did then close wedge osteotomy and fixed it with a plate. This was the lateral view. And this were the alignment X-rays, the long leg views. 
you can see on the left side is perfectly aligned by passing the deformity and on the right side we converted it from the severe virus to hardly 5 5 degrees of virus on the right but on the right side this was a condition at 9 months of the index surgeon she was going into a non union this was the excess ap view this was the lateral view at this stage we decided to go in and we converted it into a total knee replacement with a long stem tibial implant we just remove the proximal screws and we were able to negotiate the stem this was the lateral view this was the x ray one year of this surgery the fracture had united the lateral view this is the x ray at around 3 years it's a complete union of the fractures the ap and the lateral views this was her range of motion with full extension as well as full flexion of the knees and this was her walking video deepak by excellent case i think we've got an idea uh just one question that yes, her natural fracture which she had yes, when sir. she was younger yes sir she was in a gross varus position yes sir healed yeah and the osteotomy that you made yeah in a controlled environment a closed wedge osteotomy correcting the deformity did not heal yeah why do you think that happened Because and sure. what is the lesson there yeah uh, actually uh, the the mid, it, first of all it was a mid shaft fracture a mid shaft tibial fracture which we plated and uh, the plating as such you know it raises a lot of uh, periosteum and we did a close wedge osteotomy and uh, two factors are basically there first of all is the stability the other is the biology no dr deepak you have an excuse she was younger before <laughs> much <laughs> <Yeah>. younger <laughs> yeah so i mean yeah. nice case well well planned i have only two suggestions here one If yes the sir. extra articular deformity is in the tibia yes. they are much easier than on the femur yes, and sir. also even if it is extending outside some cases do some you know uh, studies do suggest you can correct them intraarticularly only whatever it is using a navigation and this is one of the classic indication for navigation even though navigation as a tool is disappearing yeah second uh, is because she is so young you have done an osteotomy on the right tibia and you tried to get the an extra articular deformity corrected you could have also avoided a stem on the tibial side if you got the fracture healed for the future for example if she needs a revision you have a stem on the proximal tibia on the right side otherwise nicely done but thank you sir thank you thank you sir uh, shall you proceed for the next one last yes last, yes yes so there some changes if there is any suggestion let us know uh, next uh, case is by dr harsha joshi uh, sunshine hospital well done dr deepak thakur nice case thank you thank dr. you sir you can share dr harsha yes. you could start sharing please yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, narayan sir. harsha joshi is not from uh, sunshine hospital that's what they yes. sent it to me on oh, my mobile yes, just now <laughs> so, so basically i work at three places Okay. In Surat, it's quite far from yeah. Hyderabad. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Guruva, Guruva, everybody is from Sunshine Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good evening, sir. Uh, uh, I, I, I present my case: the windswept in deformity in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay, we fine. can. She was 56 years old <clears throat> when she presented. It was multiple joint pain and deformity. Since also 15 years of of their period, knee pain since last 10 years. So previous that multiple joint pain was there in foot, ankle, elbow everywhere, but main pain started in the last 10 years. Difficulty in walking since last two years. She was managing to walk. Now not able to stand 
on single leg without help and support so an examination uh, i found at that time the right knee fmd of 5 degree and varus deformity of 40 degree and left side it was valgus degree deformity of 40 degree and 5 degree recurve deformity range of movement was painful and restricted to almost fraction of 80 degree only so this was the clinical pictures right side it is varus deformity left side valgus deformity each leg standing both legs take she was able to stand without support of other people but you see the foot elbow all other joints they are deformed and they are also affected this is full length x ray showing a varus and valgus almost 40 degree on either side valgus as well as varus so this is the pictures uh, taken in detail at that time now we can see that almost it is full deformity and full phase on both side one side varus second side valgus so this is a single stage surgery done on both side together and correction was achieved on table on full correction on both side valgus as well as varus on left and right side now this is the thing i have done so it was on right side i have to do a sliding medial epigondal osteotomy to correct the varus deformity at that time which is fixed with a screw and uh, only tibial roads are used the femur seems to be good so at that time i kept it everything ready but i have done only uh, road fixation in the tibial part at that time the correction uh, was achieved on table on both side togetherly so if you see because of the medial sliding femoral epicondyle osteotomy uh, i can correct the varus deformity at the same sitting on right side also this is the later views of that patient these are the cases because of two day before standing on one leg right side as well as left side and this is the video of patient walking after 3 years of surgery arshad bhai excellent result thank you sir nice. so this is the, the uh, procedure i have done so uh, this is regarding the poke. all say see the deformity correction as in walking she is coming from front side also so this was the correction achieved uh, after um, surgery and during present time also so as she was rheumatoid with probably very soft bones what yes. were the special precautions that you had to take during surgery if in each stage in each stage i was afraid of fracture so especially the femoral fractures because the, in right side especially there was flexion deformity so while correcting it i had to cut the distal femur more but while doing that time if i do more then i sliding osteotomy of femoral epicondyle might not be possible as such so only posterior release was done and gradual corrections like hemon by pre uh, told previously that you go step by step so whenever you correct it every exact time when you feel that it is now corrected you can have fixation of that so even after that also there was deformity on medial side so that i done epigondyle osteotomy on right side and left side it was all right because of the valgus and i have to able to correct it i also saw that there is a lot of foot deformity also yes yes uh, but, so but i would is... actually just just one minute i would ask guruva and hemant also because i remember my time in uk we were correcting a lot of these feet also by doing metatarsal osteotomies and mtp excisions uh, is anybody doing this commonly here Uh, can i just i've never done one foot uh, vikram in the last 20 years so zero zero, <laughs> zero. zero. okay they had yeah. done this with actually see this same story with me as well i have done uh, around some uh, 47 cases and published in birmingham after coming here done five in last 10 years <laughs> i think it is because we don't wear you know uh, shoes uh, our people i think their priority is different that's why yes the so patient priority was knee only rather than foot so even we advise that you get the corrected foot then they said no this is okay i am i'm happy with this but so how is not ready for any surgery having said that neelan major 10 to 15% patients post tcr even 2 3 years after they will come and complain pain in the ankles right yeah but we we, do, we can't do anything just tell them it will go off <laughs> i don't want to touch any more feet at all yeah if you have time i can present another case 
Yeah, you got one more guess? Yes, sir. Yeah, good, good. That was selected by Dr. Narayan. By uh, this one, this one. Nilan, he is the last presenter, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the last presenter. Okay. So I am going to present another case. She is sixty years old. Years of old when she is present with pain in both knees since four years. History of left knee unit needed to care that was a unit replacement done before five years. So when she was almost fifty five years of age, left side was operated for uni. Abnormal sensation of something popping out and in with often locking up the left knee with pain. So getting relief after pressing it backward with some clicking sound. So this is a typical complaint of the patients that after surgery. Almost one or two years went good, but since two three years, I am finding that is locking off and on. At that time, I done the anterior door test was negative, but varus valgus strain opens the left joint with some click sound. So that gave me idea of thinking that is maybe going in wrong way. So this was the X-ray I took at that time. Right side, say primary O.N.E. Left side, it was with some uh, tilt of the base plate of unicondal medial side. And if you see the dot of that all of the polyethylene insert, it is going medially upward. So each time when the, she goes to flexion and extension, that movement occurs in each flexion and extension movements. So in further also lateral view, if you see it is going posteriorly. When it goes, it, uh, when it comes in flexion, it comes anteriorly. So this was the situation of movement in each time. And uh, if you see in detail, that that polyethylene insert is going almost on the outer side. It was midway of that part, so this was failing gradually. It was deepening in down, and that gives more pain to the patient. So these are the clinical photograph of the patients, right side as well left side, single leg standing also. So on right side I have done the primary TKR, on left side I have inserted one road because I I was feeling that the gap which was created because of the tilting of the uni uh, tibial part, so that will be giving more. Stress on that, so I have extended the road so that gives support to the metaphyseal part to the almost diaphyseal part. So that's why I've done on that side with the road, and that side without road. So this is the picture after doing uh, say replacement on right side primarily and left side removing the puny as a whole and doing the uh, replacement on left side. Only tibial extended road was used. Otherwise, femoral component was some simple like other other primary knee. So this was the cases which I have done. Uh, in a two part so one is regarding rheumatoid arthritis i can see with after uni in this uni case why do you think it failed so early uh maybe she she is very active almost for 2 3 years and second thing i don't have any uh, immediate post op x rays but i think that the whatever implant which is kept at that time it was some in tilted positions that may be the reason i i perceive Yes, the malalignment is the most common reason, yes. and one of the reason is a uh, the commonest is a uh, the tibial medial plateau failing because of the stress fracture kind of thing. That's why they advise not to put too many pins on the medial side. Make right. sure that you know it is in good alignment, not much of pins, so that you know it will not get uh, a stress injury under the subcondral area. Right. So this well completes my presentation. I uh -huh. thank you, Guru Arady Sir, Nilan Bai, as well as Naran. Thank you all. Fantastic session. Yeah. Right. I think that ends the first day. I think uh, very successful and very fruitful. I thank uh, Neelan and Narayan both you, for uh, carrying you. so well. And I congratulate the young guys, uh, Shalbi Hospital, Kalpesha, uh, Proxy, and uh, Harshad Joshi, and uh, Deepak Thakur. Deepak from Delhi, right? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. And uh, thank you so much once again. And I want all of you to join tomorrow also and weekend session. And uh, Nilen, Narayan, Hemant, almost 300 plus people are logged throughout the four hours. Wonderful, wonderful. That is wonderful. Wonderful. Great. Total around 800 registrations. And uh, last three hours, almost 300 people were uh, enjoying the session. Wonderful. And that shows the reputation of ISHK. And definitely we will take this forward. And Nara and Nilen, you are the future stars, my friends. 
Thank so, you. Good morning to Thank you. Me. And let us take it to next level. So, bye bye. Good night. Take care. You all tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, sir. Bye. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Huh? Huh?